My 23-year-old mother was murdered when I was a baby. It happened in our house and nobody knew what actually happened. Throughout my life, there have been times where I feel like she's around. And the last few weeks, I felt like it nonstop. I don't have any form of audio or video to prove this, but I feel her and I've seen her in dreams for years. So for a little backstory, her life was tragically cut short in 1998. I was two and the youngest of three children. I was the only one home when she died. My dad, brother and sister were on a mini trip for the week. I think why I feel her and my siblings have it is because when she passed away, she knew I was still home. And I think she wanted to protect me and just hasn't ever left. So the house I mentioned where my mum's life was cut short, I used to see shadow figures pretty commonly. I never saw her, but I felt her presence from time to time since I was a kid. And I would see shadow figures. And at one point I drew them, but the drawings are on an iPad that is now broken. The two main ones I would see were a shadow figure wearing a hat, which I've read is pretty common. I never saw eyes nor face. It was just that, a dark mass. This was always seen in the downstairs bedroom. The other shadow figure I would see a lot was a long, lanky one. I don't think I've read about them, but they were long and seemed to be slouched down. They usually look like they have their heads held down like they were sad. Sometimes I would see two or three of these at once. I never saw these in my bedroom, almost always on the main floor of the house, and even if I looked at them, it's like they needed me to see them. Kind of rarely, but sometimes around the house, I would see the hooded shadow figure, who again, I think is a common one. The hats and hooded shadows always seem scary, but not the lanky sad ones. I wouldn't go near them if I saw them, but I never felt scared or hid when I did. So, there's been a time I've seen a ghost as well. I was in my bedroom upstairs. I remember I woke up and saw a bright ghost. I could see his face in uniform and he told me to get out, which is when I moved my bedroom from upstairs to downstairs. The ghost almost appeared to look like a civil war or colonial man. I'm not a history person, but he was definitely old timey. The last story is one of my brother's friends that used to come over all the time and would always hang out in the basement. The basement was unfinished when we moved in, but we finished it and the bathroom in the basement was always scary to me. It always felt like I was being watched in there, even though I never saw anything. So anyway, my brother's friend one day went in there and ran out and had my dad call his parents to pick him up. We didn't know why for many years until one day he told us that he saw a full bodied apparition of an old man with a big beard in there. After that, he never returned to our house. After we moved, I've never seen a shadow or ghost. It's been seven years now. I still feel my mom's presence like I used to in the old house. About two years ago, my Nana bought home a Ouija board that she found at a yard sale. I've always been a true believer in the paranormal and it's always been one of my peak interests. I've heard and read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess around with a Ouija board. And quite frankly, they sort of freaked me out. So I wanted nothing to do with it. My Nana, on the other hand, doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever and thought it would be a fun game for myself, my brother, and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in the hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother of 11 and my cousin of 12 bugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain it to them that it wasn't just a game and that it shouldn't be messed with, but they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things they shouldn't. One day after I got home from work, 
the boys were there, and I had this sneaking suspicion they played with it. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I had this odd feeling, and when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it, at first, they denied it. But I saw right through them and they finally admitted that they had played with it. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done, and they said they did. My cousin likes to over-exaggerate stories big time and make up details to be overly dramatic. So when he told me about a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other. So I assumed that that was happening now. A couple of nights later, I got into bed. And as I lay there trying to fall asleep, I get this feeling like I'm being watched. I look over at my closet that has two large sliding doors, and I notice that one of the doors is slightly ajar, which left a small space between the doors. It creeped me out for some reason, so I turned and faced the other way, trying to ignore everything and fall asleep. I finally fell asleep, and the next thing I know, I'm woken up by what felt like someone or something hitting me in the back of the head. I was laying on my back, so the back of my head was fully on my pillow, which made it even weirder. And it wasn't a light hit either. It freaked me out so much, I was shaking. I look around my room and don't see anything. But then, all of a sudden, I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. I'm so freaked out at this point, it wasn't funny. After laying there a good little while, I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat down and tried to calm, but I still could feel a tingling pulsing sensation on the back of my head. I turned on my phone and realized it was three in the morning. I called my boyfriend, now husband, with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up, and I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my nana got up around six. I didn't tell her what happened, because I knew she wouldn't believe me and say that I was acting dumb. After she got up, I had breakfast, and called my boyfriend again and he finally answered. He told me he had his phone on silent, so he didn't know that I had been calling. I gave him so much crap for this, and told him what happened, and he felt so bad and like an idiot for having his phone on silent. He told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me, and was so apologetic. Later that day, he never came over, and we took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in my family that knows what happened, and I didn't experience anything after I got rid of it. Moral of the story, Ouija boards shouldn't be messed with. First off, I need to let you know that I don't believe in ghosts. I consider myself a rationalist and always try to look for a rational and logical explanation to things without jumping to a conclusion. That being said, I'm having a lot of trouble explaining what I've been experiencing in our new house for the last few months. Me and my wife recently moved into an old army home. They're offered to all acting soldiers in my country in a very cheap, most of them were built in the 60s and 80s. Our house is at the very back of a much larger section, at the top of a hill and overlooks a valley with a dense native forest below. It's very cozy and offers a lot of privacy with no immediate neighbors in a good view. At first, I had a couple of weird encounters that left me scratching my head, such as when I was walking from the front door to my car when I heard a loud banging on my tin roof as if something hard, like an acorn, had landed on it and was bouncing down. Whatever it was, it bounced off the roof and into the branches of the tree in our front yard, which begins to sag under the weight of the thing. There were no branches hanging over our house that could have dropped anything, and I couldn't see any fall off the roof, nor did any land on the ground after it made the tree branches sag. I thought it was weird, and mentioned it to my wife at the time, but just sort of brushed it off. Then, 
There were the windows in my living room. Me and my wife live alone. I had our windows open to let the breeze in because it was a hot summer's night and I decided to close them since it was time for bed. As I closed them, my wife called me outside to the backyard since she had spotted the International Space Station moving across the sky. After I came back in, I sat down on the couch and I noticed the curtains were flapping in the wind. I walked over to check the windows I had just closed and they were now wide open. I know for certain I had closed it just moments ago when my wife was outside the whole time, so she couldn't have opened it. I asked if she saw me close that window and she said she was standing in the doorway and watched me do it. I kept asking her if she was messing with me, but I can't figure out how it could have happened. The last and most troubling incident was what prompted me to make this post. Last night, I went to bed just after my wife who was already asleep. I lay in bed browsing on my phone when suddenly I noticed I could hear what sounded like heavy breathing. I stopped and listened for a moment, assuming it was just my wife snoring or something. But she was sleeping right next to me, and this sounded like it was coming from the far corner of the bedroom. I focused on the sound for what felt like several minutes, while being paralyzed with fear. I was convinced someone was standing at the end of my bed. I woke up my wife. She was half asleep until I said I thought it sounded like someone was in the house, which made her bolt up, and then she said she could hear it too. I then turned on all the lights and went around the house, checking all our locks and cupboards, and didn't sleep well that night. Has anyone experienced anything like this before? Am I just being paranoid? I'm usually quite level-headed, but this is starting to make me question my own sanity and judgment. I have several scary stories, but this one is particularly fresh as it just happened the other day. I went for a bit of a walk because we're allowed to exercise, came back, went to put my key in the door, and I've always had this thing where I hate, hate static shocks. So I very lightly touch the doorknob with the tip of my finger, and the doorknob suddenly turned to the side like someone was about to leave the house at that instant. I opened the door expecting to have a laugh about it, and no one was on the other side. I've since tried to replicate it. The doorknob is a bit looser on the other side, but the side that faces outwards is sturdy, and was a feathered light touch on my part. In order to wrench the doorknob like that, you'd need to grip it and twist. Still can't explain it, but given that I see shadows move around the house and random things fall over, People have independently commented on the weird vibe of the two downstairs rooms without prompting, and a video once unpaused for me the second I walked through my door, and beginning to wonder if there's something inhabiting it other than myself. As much as I do believe in the paranormal, I don't usually get the opportunity to experience it firsthand. I want to start off by saying, but being from Hawaii, there are many superstitions that I still follow to this day in respecting my ancestors and understanding my culture. I work in the film industry and sometimes where we shoot tends to be in certain sacred locations back in the old Hawaiian days. For example, if it was just me on a hiking trip, I would have done to chant an ollie to grant me safe passage. However, this job pretty much disregards those types of locations if it's considered a tourist area. We were filming at Waimea Falls, which has a rich history of the paranormal, located on the island of Oahu. As the day was wrapping up, I found out one of the crew members left some equipment back at the falls, and I volunteered on retrieving it. It was completely dark, and it was about a 10 minute drive via a quad to trek up the narrow path towards the falls. I had a colleague help me in locating it in the forest to no avail. I kept feeling eyes were watching us and we shouldn't linger any longer. We decided to leave and got back on the four wheeler to head back to base camp. As my colleague was trying to fix the gear, the headlights were beaming our exit. I glanced over to see a shadowy figure standing in the middle of our path. 
Thinking in my head, that's not right. I looked away, hoping it was only an illusion of some kind. I blinked, hoping I wasn't crazy, and I turned to see if the figure was still there. To my horror, the shadow figure stood 10 feet away from me, blocking our path in front of the headlights. Mind you, these lights were on high beam, illuminating the front road, and all the darkness tucked far back except for the figure. Trying not to cause any alarm to my colleague who didn't want to notice the figure, I quickly closed my eyes shut and told him to hurry up and drive. He asked what was wrong, but I didn't budge until we were back in our well-lit environment. I felt ashamed for causing a disturbance, even though it was unintentional. I sent a prayer before my departure and hoped the being could remain at peace, but that experience was a shocker for the first time. Thankfully, it didn't follow me home. This incident happened last year in 2019. Unfortunately, I don't have any proof for the fact that I was completely chicken under those circumstances. Mahalo nui loa for reading this story. And please do not piss off any ghosts on your excursions, people. My parents were both military. They were relocated to Austin, Texas in 92. Something was delayed and their housing was put on hold. So the people in charge placed my parents into temporary housing. To my mother's horror, it was a Skullsy, very dated double wide tin trailer, which was moldy, roach and rodent infested, and the windows leaked and the place couldn't hold heat. Since my dad had to travel more than an hour to and from the base, Mom was left alone for hours at night. She, one night, decided she wasn't going to wait up for my dad and turned in early. She got dressed for bed, turned on the hall light for my dad, and turned out her light and laid down. Just after she closed her eyes, she let out a sigh after her head hit the pillow, and all went quiet. Though suddenly she heard a shuffle sound. She was kind of confused. Dad's truck wasn't heard coming into the driveway, so he definitely wasn't home. Mum held her breath to listen, and the shuffle sound was like footsteps, with the heel lazily sliding to the floor with each step. Mum had her back to the bedroom door, and the footsteps were just wandering down the hall. It entered the bedroom. Mum propped herself on her elbows and looked over her shoulder. The light in the hall was glowing into the bedroom. Nothing was there, but the shuffle sound was right there by the bed now. Mum tried to focus on where the noise was coming from. Then, whatever it was, sat on the bed. There was nothing on the bed except for a divot on the comforter, as if someone was sitting right there, in bed. Mum continued to hold her breath, calmly got up, walked over and switched on the light and shut the door behind her and fell asleep on the couch. My parents stayed in the place for just two months, and nothing, fortunately, ever happened again. I have another story I wish to share. I had a co-worker called John who grew up closely to the Native American culture, so John was taught about spirits. The subject of the paranormal does not faze him. When he moved into a new house, something was different about it. It didn't bother him enough to be concerned about anything, he just got on with his life. Though after his first week, John felt pretty rubbish about being there, kind of feeling like he had to look around his environment a little bit more than usual. Trying to lounge in his living room in the same evening, there was a knock at his front door. It was a firm knock, but not urgent. He got up, muted the TV, and went to answer it. When he got to the door and opened up, no one was there. There were no passing cars, it was a dead-end driveway and he only had two neighbors. They were about a three minute walk apart. There was no one. John shut the door and went back to his chair. Just as he pressed on mute, the knock happened again. It was the same firm knock. He frowned and walked back over, but again, there was no one. He shut the door and waited this time. It's a prank, friggin' kids, he thought. But not a minute later, the knock happened, and he swung the door open, and there was no one there, just an open lawn, no trees or shrubs for hiding. He sighed, 
agitated but cautious, closed the door without letting go of the knob, even faster than before it knocked again. John, this time, was very agitated and really flung the door open. There definitely wasn't any time for kids to try and vanish into the darkness. John was now angry. If you don't stop this right now, I'm going to get you. He stepped outside his door, breathed in the fresh air and listened. Nothing. John sighed in annoyance and went back inside. Nothing ever happened again. There is one final story I wish to share. Sasha had just ended a relationship. She needed to move quickly and in a hurry. A friend of hers knew a landlord who had just opened up a double wide for rent on one of their properties, so it was perfect timing. Sasha signed the paperwork unseen, got the keys immediately and started moving in. The trailer was spacious. You walked into a large living space. The kitchen had an open counter bar and connected dining. Perfect, she thought. As soon as she started sorting boxes by assigned rooms, Sasha really looked around the home. To the left of the living room from the front door was a long hallway, one bedroom to the right, the bathroom to the left, and down the hall, the master bedroom. Going to the master bedroom to set things up was the first thing Sasha noticed when she was taken by surprise. There on the wall was something odd. It was yarn and sticks. Macrame decorations? She got closer and realized it was very primitive, a crudely wrapped dream catcher. It's a hoop, and it looked like it was about to snap. The yarn was covered in cobwebs, weaved into the yarn were your basic plastic junk beads from a kid's craft box, and there were strands of yarn hanging and twisted together in multiple knots with a chicken's foot. Gross, she thought, and tossed it out into the trash. Well, she didn't get to stay in her new place for the first two days. She had to travel a distance between her old home and stayed with her parents who had kept her dog for the transition time. But Sasha did get a chance to continue to unpack between work and her parents' house. On the third day, everything was put together enough. She collected her dog and went straight to her new home for the first full night stay. All evening, Sasha was unpacking. By the time she stopped and looked at the time, it was 2.30 a.m., bedtime. All the lights were turned off and she settled in her room with some YouTube and her dog on the bed. At 3 a.m., Sasha noticed her dog staring out the bedroom door. He is alert, kind of tense looking. Sasha put her phone down, trying to focus on her own scenes, when she heard it. Small, evenly timed thuds. It was faint, but Sasha could hear someone walking around her living room. She lived alone. The doors and windows were locked, or at least they should have been. There's no way anyone could have broken in without making much more noise. Fear tightened in her chest. Then the footsteps stopped, and suddenly, the steps came thudding down the hallway. She sat straight up in bed, her dog barking, hackles raised, but refused to leave her side. The thud of running feet came to a stop right at her bedroom door. Sasha then heard laughter, a giggle of a small child, and then feet running again down the hallway. Screw this, Sasha said. She got up, ran to her door, slammed it shut, slid her dresser across the entry, and the next morning, she found small, childlike sized handprints all over the window in the living room. It wasn't her imagination from staying up late, so it seemed. She called a friend who knew a girl who would do house cleanses with sage and prayer. It worked, because after that she never found or heard anything inexplicable again. It wasn't until I brought up the subject of voodoo religion of how hanging a chicken's foot above your door is supposed to ward off evil. So Sasha believes that maybe the crusty or dream catcher was holding something at bay. Nothing further ever happened between the cleansing, but still, I kind of wonder about the old dream catcher, possibly warding away a spirit who couldn't rest. I met my wife when I was 26. 
I suppose it can be considered ironic, really, that it was a funeral which brought us together, especially considering the events I would experience upon moving in with her. I was never really a believer of the paranormal. I guess, if we have to apply labels to ourselves, mine would be of a skeptic. Of course, like most people, I had watched various videos on the internet, read stories of hauntings, and occasionally indulged in the odd horror film or two. But my interests were only ever viewed from an outside perspective, and could only really be considered academic at most. Without a frame of reference, I found it hard to believe in these stories, and view them as anything but stories. That would soon change, however, as we quickly fell in love, and I moved in with her shortly after. She had told me about the house before I moved in. She had been living there for 10 years, before she had even met me. And by that time, there was a lot to tell. Her friends had all experienced something there. They each had their own tale of the unknown. One of her oldest friends had an experience while staying over for the night, witnessed what can only be described as the outline of a woman move slowly through the room before dissipating abruptly into the darkness. He never slept alone in the house again. My soon-to-be stepchildren would often when young, point to an empty space in the corner of a room, and innocently ask, who is that lady? A horrifying experience, of course, but discountable on its own. If it were not, for the other children who would always say the same thing, every single time they visited our home, it would always be the same question, and it would always be the same corner of the room things would only get worse. I remember how my wife recalls the odd smells which would materialize as if from nowhere, the unexplainable noises which would break the peace of the night and foreboding feeling of not feeling quite alone when you knew you were the only person in the house. It did not take her long to reach out to a paranormal investigation team. They attended our home with Kieran O'Caffey, a paranormal investigator who enjoyed a brief stint of fame after being featured on Most Haunted, a television show which ran here in the United Kingdom. They brought along a psychic, who not long after entering the home had an unnatural aversion to one particular corner of the room. The room, which would soon become my new bedroom, and the particular corner where the children had witnessed the lady. Without any prompt, the psychic explained to my wife that the previous occupant of our house, a woman, had ended her life via rope in that very corner. She finished her reading of the house by sketching a picture of the apparition, a drawing my wife still keeps to this very day. Suffice to say, all of this did little to alleviate my wife's concerns. And this is where I come in. Poor naive me. Brazen and full of all the misplaced logic that only a skeptic would apply to a situation which so clearly required it. Well, I even decided that our bed would go in that corner of the room. Looking back now, I can only lament at my childish bravado. My first night was unremarkable, of course. There was the typical excitement about me moving in, but nothing which could be considered otherworldly. At that point in my life, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but lacked any real motivation. That did not stop me, however, from tapping away at my laptop until the early hours of the morning, while my wife slept soundly in the corner. Around one in the morning was when it started. It began slightly at first, but it quickly became more noticeable as the minutes progressed. A sound, a noise of sorts, it sounded like scratching, and it was coming from the direction of our bed. I paused my work for a second and turned quickly around in the darkness, my ears directing me towards the source of the noise. My wife was still sleeping in the corner, her face concealed by the shadows. 
She lays stationary, blissfully unaware of the unnatural sound, which had itched its way from the wall near her head. Now, however, I gazed into the blackness of the room. The noise could no longer be heard, almost as if it were never there. A fleeting shimmer of imagination jolted into existence by my wary, fatigued mind. The room all of a sudden felt tight and confining. The walls, although stationary, appeared to have moved an inch while I was busy, closing themselves while restricting my movement. It was an odd sensation, one which burrowed deep, one which felt as if it would be with me for quite some time to come. Chalking the whole feeling up to exhaustion, I closed my laptop and quietly climbed into bed next to my wife. Predictably, sleep came soon. What are you doing? I inhaled deeply, my body swaying somewhat as my consciousness returned to me. Baby, what are you doing down here? It took a second for my mind to return to me, but when it did I found myself awakening abruptly, standing on my feet in the middle of our pitch black kitchen. It's just after two, are you okay? Even through the darkness, I could see the concern etched into my wife's beautiful features. Her eyes were wide and telling as her lips repeated her plea for answers. Are you okay? It took a second to collect myself, my confusion crippling in a heavy sort of way. I am, I began, my mind struggling to comprehend what was happening. I think I was just sleepwalking, I added. My words sounded more of a question than a statement. My wife looked me over once before the concern drifted from her face. Shh, it's okay, she whispered, extending her arm out to me. Let's get you back to bed. I weakly offered my arm and allowed her to guide me back upstairs to our room where I quickly fell back asleep. Up until this point, I had never sleepwalked in my entire life. I talked in my sleep, sure, but never sleepwalking. That was new to me, and it was a disturbing sensation to say the least. It followed me into the next day and persisted throughout. Somehow, it felt more than just sleepwalking. Somehow, I just knew. The day passed like a dream, and before I knew it, night had fallen once more. Do you want to talk about it? My wife asked, lying next to me on the bed. I shook my head. Even though the room was silent, I still felt as if I could hear the scratching. No, I'm fine, I lied, as I pulled the covers over and turned over. Okay, I love you, baby, she whispered. I love you too. It's dark, and I'm standing in our kitchen. I inhaled deeply and took a second to steady myself, my limbs shaking as the realization of what happened crept slowly through my body. This time my wife wasn't there to comfort me. This time, every single drawer had been removed from their cabinets and were now perched precariously on the various surfaces above. What is happening? Confused and distressed, I began to quietly slip each drawer up back into the cabinet, which housed them, and then slunk carefully back upstairs to bed. Just before my fragile mind drifted back into the sleep of abyss, I felt as if I could hear it again, a scratching, tearing and cutting somewhere deep within the walls. I did not tell my wife of this second transgression. I thought she would only worry. Ironically, this seemed to make matters worse as she quickly picked up on my silence throughout the day as we continued unpacking the rest of my belongings. What's wrong? She asked, sitting next to me on the sofa. I struggled to comprehend an answer. After all, what was wrong? I couldn't even fathom a response, let alone formulate the words required to convey the feeling which lingered deep inside me. My lips moved, and I found myself saying the first thing which came into my mind. I think we should move the bed. She nodded slightly at my words. She knew what I meant by them, even though I never actually had to say it. Okay, we can move it first thing tomorrow. One more night, 
okay? Because I'm shattered. One more night. I could make it one more night. The hours passed and again the sky turned black as we drifted peacefully off to sleep. Baby, stop, please, you're scaring me. Suddenly I was aware that I was not in bed. I was standing, but was still in the room. A few seconds later, I realized I was standing upright on the bed facing the wall. I looked down at my wife, the horror clear even through the darkness. What was the only word which seemed to come? She was shaking, obviously. After a few moments of silence, she collected herself and brought her arms up to me. Come on, come here. Confused, I once again allowed myself into her arms as she guided me back into the mattress. Her hand moved up to my hair as she began to run her fingers lovingly through it. Shh, it's okay. Go back to sleep. My mind quickly sank back into nothingness. In the morning, she explained exactly what happened. She had awoken suddenly in the night when she realized that I wasn't laying next to her. After rolling over, she was shocked to find me standing upright on the bed, silently and still staring at the wall with my back to her. She tried to call out to me before I finally answered. Understandably, this shook her up quite a bit. I went on to divulge the second instance of my sleepwalking and soon after we moved the bed from the corner of the room. To this day, we've never slept in that corner again. It's been six years since then, and we still avoid going anywhere near that corner. My sleepwalking has not happened since we moved the bed, and thankfully, I've never heard the scratching again either. To be honest, I try not to think about those three nights so long ago. It's hard to because I never really got any closure. If I had seen a ghost, if I could have at least pointed a finger, yep, ghouls. If I maybe had seen a rat or a mouse, I could have explained away the scratching, but there was nothing. It all just stopped just as suddenly as it had begun. The second we vacated that particular corner of the room, and I guess looking back on it now, that's the most horrifying part of it all. I will never know why these things happen, and even more hauntingly, I'll never be able to predict if they will ever happen again. And that is the thought which lingers most during the dark nights, repeating with my mind as I tap away at my keyboard and hoping to God that I never hear that awful scratching ever again. About eight years ago, when I was a senior in high school, me and two of my very close friends decided to break into this house that was down a back road that we passed every day to go to one of their houses after school. The house was kept up, but no one had lived there in over 10 years at the time. And by kept up, I mean the lawn was mown and the lights were always on. It was pretty well known in the community that no one lived there, but the bills were paid by someone and no one had lived there in years. So being teenagers, we decided to check it out after dark. There was a driveway that led to a covered garage in the back of the property that couldn't be seen from the road. We pulled in just after 11 p.m. and made our way back to the garage and we parked. The entrance was clear and there wasn't a soul around. Since the garage was behind the house, we made our way to the back entrance of the house and noticed there was a plywood slab that covered the back door's windowed top half. We proceeded to pry the cover off the door and revealed that the windows had been broken before, probably by another group of teens in the past, and we had our entrance. Once we climbed through, each helping the last through the window, and into what was the kitchen at the back of the house. Once in the kitchen, we moved to the eerily tidy living room of the house, which was sort of infamous for being the room in the house with the lights on. There were magazines all dated to 1998, stacked neatly on the table in the middle of the room. And it was fairly clear that an elderly woman had once been the occupant. 
there was a sewing station and deco to suggest this. We felt safe at this point. We had made it in there, and there weren't neighbors or anything for half a mile in either direction. We sat around for about a half hour, freestyle rapping, laughing, and smoking a joint. We toured the rest of the house and ended up back in the living room. It was overall pretty creepy, but pretty typical too. Just seemed like a normal household that hadn't been changed in 15 years. This is where it gets weird. We were still cutting up in the living room and had actually turned the lights off because we were filming each other with my Lenovo laptop. Something we did for fun all the time back then. So we could relive it and show our friends that we had braved the empty house on the back road. When all of a sudden, there was a sound like an old guttural truck trying its hardest to stay idle. The uneven rumble of an engine. It's hard to explain. I personally thought for a split second, it was the air unit's fan outside the living room wall, or something along those lines. We froze in place and looked around at each other in the dark. Terrified faces stared back at me, illuminated by the glow of the laptop. After 10 seconds of the rumble, there was a squeak and a heavy truck door slammed shut right outside the living room wall. Now we scrambled. No hesitation, we bolted for the front door that also connected to the living room because climbing through that back door window would have been difficult in a panic, but the front door had actually been nailed shut. So we turned and ran to the other side of the house in the back bedroom that was also on the back side of the house. We all three froze and didn't move a muscle. The engine rumble wasn't audible anymore but we were trapped like mice. There were huge bushes covering every window and the front door was nailed shut. The only way out was the way we had come in, but we were literally scared motionless. We sat in the bedroom waiting for the police or owner or someone to call out that our fun is over and to come out, but that never happened. There was a window to the backyard in our hiding spot covered by a huge bush. I personally was directly next to it. My buddies very close to me, almost huddled around me. They could see and hear everything. And let me remind you that after the slam of the truck door, it was absolutely silent inside and out besides us scrambling to the back. All of a sudden chills go up my arm and back and I slowly turned my head to my friends who looked like they were about to keel over from fright. Footsteps in crunching leaves were coming slowly, directly to the window that we were hiding behind. They stopped as close as they could without walking directly into the bush and we froze again. The footsteps we heard approaching the window were undoubtedly bipedal. After the steps stopped outside the window, we were immobilized with fear for nearly a minute, maybe more. We sat there waiting for the steps to depart or someone to call out at us, which never happened. The steps stopped outside the window and never moved. Only then did we silently agree. It was time to back out the room slowly as we were horrified by what exactly could be staring towards us in this window. And at that moment, we threw caution to the wind. We got up, slowly backpedaled away from the window and made our way into the hallway outside the room and into the area before the kitchen where our exit was now back in sight. I think all three of us knew that something was very wrong about all of this. And I think getting caught by the police or the owner wasn't on any of our minds. This was very surreal and felt almost like a prank because there's no way people of authority would be haunting us in the way whoever was outside had been doing. So fed up of what felt like an eternity of unease and terror, we decide to bolt to the window in the door in the kitchen all at once and go out together to either face what had been tormenting us or run. Once we were outside, we counted down from three and ran past the huge bushes to the left where our stalker had been. I couldn't help it. I had to turn around and look. 
I turned, and all I saw were the lights beaming from the window broken up by the bush and illuminating a patch of ground covered in what appeared to be undisturbed leaves. This made my whole body crawl in a way I've never felt before or honestly after. We made it to my car in the garage, and I backed out and tore away as fast as I ever had. There was no vehicle outside. There wasn't anything. There was a deafening silence and stillness. We are still very uneasy talking about it to this day. Even writing this makes my eyes water and my skin crawl. I've always been a man of science and a huge skeptic, but I can't explain that night. There was something so wrong about everything. Needless to say, we never went back. I work as a manager in an adult novelty store with a theater. So please envision the kind of customers I get. I had this regular who was nice enough and we always exchanged pleasantries and small talk. One day we said goodbye and as he went to leave, he stopped dead in his tracks and came back to the counter. He told me that he ignores it every time, but today it wouldn't let him. Naturally, I ask him what he's talking about, and he proceeds to tell me that there is an older black man who was with me 24 seven. He sees him every time I'm in the store. The older man just stands next to me, watching me and smiling. At that point, a chill ran up my spine because no one in that store knows besides my boss that I'm half black and that my 65 year old black father that I was so close to passed in 2014. I said the usual, wow, oh my God. So I wouldn't give anything away to see what else he said to see if it's legit. The customer proceeds to tell me that the man, my father, is sad about his kids not doing what he asked them to do. And one child in particular has greatly disappointed him. The man, my father, also wants the customer to tell me how much he loves his wife, even though she's married again. At this point, I have tears in my eyes now, because how would this man know there's conflict between me and my siblings because of my father's death? How would this man know my mother is married again? He kept mentioning that he could feel a strong religious pull with my father. My father was a preacher. He told me a bunch of other things and asked if I was pregnant. I told him no, but apparently my next child will have my father's soul according to him. My two year old son looks like my father and loves his favorite songs. I never saw the man again after that. My father was very no nonsense, pragmatic ghosts don't exist kind of guy. He briefly served in the army back in the mid seventies as a rescue and recovery specialist, or as he put it simply motorpool. The story he shared with me one night while we were out fishing. He had been in Gettysburg as he was a bit of a history buff and wanted to visit some places before settling down, marrying and having kids. As he lay there in bed at night, it was 1am or so, and he was a very heavy sleeper. I witnessed this man legitimately sleep through a thunderstorm that flooded most of our downtown area. I've seen him sleep through a tree crashing down next to our tent on a camping trip, and this man would not budge. Back to my main story. He had been sleeping somewhere in or near Gettysburg and had woken up in the dead middle of the night, feeling like he was being watched. As he glanced around the room, nothing really seemed out of the ordinary until he heard footsteps in the room. He didn't really give us an idea as to what they specifically sounded like. But as he's laying in bed, he hears footsteps and then watches as the mattress near his feet compresses as if someone's sitting there. But there's nothing there. No silhouette, no body, just a depression in the mattress. As far as I remember, he was alone during this event. 
He didn't really freak out or lose his mind or anything like that, but he told me that this particular event made him believe just a little bit more in the unexplainable. My best friend Amy and I have been inseparable since age 11. I basically grew up at her family's beautiful 80 acre farm in Ontario, Canada. It's one of my favorite places in the world and I have countless good memories there. I even got married there a couple of years ago. With the good memories, there are some that I cannot explain and it has made me reconsider what I know of the world. When Amy's family bought this property 20 years ago, the heritage farmhouse that came with it was in terrible shape. It was over a hundred years old and it's your typical red brick Canadian farm. When they arrived, the kitchen floor was caved in, open like a pit. It was full of bones. They assumed that it was perhaps a garbage chute below the cooking area, but there were many different kinds of bones, including animals we typically don't eat. Weird. But they went ahead and filled it in and repaired the house. Over the years, they have transformed the place dramatically. And it's been cool to watch the process. When we were 12, Amy's youngest sister, Chloe, came up to Amy and I out of the blue and suggested we tie her up and put her in the cellar. It was obviously a weird request, but we obliged thinking it would be funny. She was a bit of a brat and it would give us a spooky thrill. We followed her down to the dirt floor basement, which of course had always felt like the creepiest place in the house and proceeded to tie her hands and feet with some soft jump rope she had provided for us. She talked us through a list of things we needed to do in a quiet monotone voice. We laid her down in the cellar which had a heavy door to keep it cool. And she instructed us to turn off the lights and shut the door. The light was off for a second before she let out a blood curdling scream. We jumped inside in a flash to see Chloe trembling, wide eyed, and she had wet herself. To this day, I have never seen someone in a state like that, an honest manic state of fear. She told us that the moment the room went dark, something heavy had shuffled in the room in a low voice and greeted her with a low rumbling, hello. The lights in the basement flickered and she recalled the hello and we all felt an enormous wave of icy fear wash over us. We scrambled to untie her and got the hell out of there. Can you remember how it felt running up the basement steps as a kid, like someone was after you? far more tangible than the usual childhood imagination. It was like something reached for us as we ran. We never played in the basement again. When we talked about it later, Chloe had no memory of ever asking us to tie her up, nor did she recall even going down to the basement. She was very hurt that we had done that to her. This annoyed Amy greatly, as she thought Chloe was just trying to get us into trouble. But Chloe never told her parents and based on the glossy look in her eyes when she asked to be lowered into the cellar floor, I believe her. When we were 15, everyone in the house was having weird experiences. Going upstairs to the bathroom, there was always something in the corner of your eye rounding a corner or peering at you from a doorway. It was unsettling to say the least. As we went through the goth and emo phase, Amy started to mess around with potion making pentagram items and other oddities. I didn't necessarily credit Amy with this, but things started to get kicked up a notch after that. I was there for a sleepover once in summer. Amy and I were sleeping in her bed and she had an alarm clock that would project the time on her ceiling in that typical red segmented alarm clock font. Weird things would always happen at certain times of the night and we would watch the red numbers and hush our girl chat at those times and listen to the house. Midnight, 111, 222, 333 and so on. One morning I woke up just as the sky was starting to lighten. I needed to use the bathroom and was sleeping on the inside of the bed against the wall, facing Amy's posters. I rolled to my back to check the time and I could not see the hour. My blurred, sleepy eyes 
focused harder, but something black was obstructing the time. My eyes widened in terror as I turned my head towards Amy and realized the blackness was an entire human figure floating in the air about a foot over Amy. It looked like a mirror of Amy, but with no discernible features or form. Humanoid, but wrong. It was not dark in the room. The morning light had filled her room with a dull grayness, and I could see details across the room. I stared at this figure in horror, moving my eyes up to its empty face. No mouth, no nose, just emptiness. When my eyes met the full face, bright white eyes shot open and stared at me with an unbearable intensity. I shut my eyes in a flash and lay there, frozen and terrified for what felt like hours. I have never felt that level of fear in my entire life. I never heard a noise. I never felt a touch. But I felt the intense eyes upon me. At 7.30, Amy woke up to use the bathroom and listen to her hum a tiny bit eased me enough to crack an eye open. Everything in the room was normal and Amy returned to the bed with a thud and resumed sleep. I nudged her and asked if she could escort me to the bathroom. I told her about what happened later that day and she was less than pleased to hear about it and had a hard time sleeping in her room for a while after that. I'm absolutely certain I was awake and there was not a single ounce of tired left in me when my eyes met, whatever that was. My earliest memory is an overheard view of the house I grew up in, roughly 30 to 40 feet above the intersection, and it showed me a crawl of words that told me the address, my name, my family's names, and ended with a message like good luck or something I quite can't remember. Then I remember being carried upstairs, and a few moments later, we had a blackout on the street. Another one was when I was a bit older. I used to walk and run around the woods behind our house. Every so often I'd hear my name get called out, so I'd return to ask anyone who was there, or if they called my name. Usually I got a confused look or thought you were in your bedroom. Eventually I figured it was my imagination and ignored it. It disappeared for a few weeks, but came back during an attempt to go further than I ever have. I was about two miles in. The voice called faintly behind me. I looked back and saw nothing and carried on. A few more feet and the voice got louder, kind of angry sounding. I ignored it and then it screamed at me and I felt something similar to getting punched in the chest and promptly turned around. There are some spooky things. Those are the most interesting. I've never actually told anyone about this, but when I was 11 and my siblings were in my room playing Halo, we had two controllers, so we're taking turns, and I was just watching my brother and sister play. My room had a bathroom connected to my sister's room that always paranoid me. So I left the door closed and locked. I noticed that the door was open and went to close it thinking my brother may have opened it. And then it was my turn. So I started playing. When I finished, I noticed that the door was open again. I told my brother very adamantly, keep this door closed, stop opening it. He and my two other siblings claimed they didn't open it. I closed it again and sat on my bed staring at it seeing why it was opening. All of a sudden the door slams open and I see some cloudy shadow that looks like a person of about five foot eight move into the bathroom. I didn't say anything and just bolted out of the room into the living room. I refused to go back into the room for about two months and slept on the couch every night. As I said, I never told anyone about this, but I assume my mum sort of knew what had happened. Because about a year ago, my mom was telling me stuff she saw in the house and never mentioned it because she didn't want to scare us. My dad also had a similar experience in that house, like seeing someone lean over him when he woke up at night. That was the only experience I had there. And now I'm a bit of a skeptical on the paranormal 
and think perhaps it may have been my imagination, or maybe airdrops opening the door, but I guess I'll never know. Back in the 80s, I was in college and lived in a dorm room. I never owned a Ouija board, but if someone had one, then I'd either watch or participate. To be honest, this was one of the first times I ever used it. I had a question for the board. My grandmother had my father when she was young and single. That was a big deal back in the 1930s. When she found out she was pregnant, she ran away from home dropped my father off at her parents' house when he was six months old and left, coming to visit less and less frequently. By the time he was five, she'd never come back at all and vanished. So my father was raised by an aunt, never really knew his mother, and didn't have any idea who his father was. By the time he was in his forties, he wanted to find her. Lots of dead ends, but he eventually did. Anyway, that night I asked the board if my grandmother was alive. The board said yes, and I asked if she lived in my home state. The board said yes. I asked if she lived in my hometown. The board said yes. I asked what street she lived on, and the board spelled out the name of the street, Washington Street. At the time, I wasn't sure if there was a Washington Street in my hometown, but it turns out there was. No, Grandma didn't live there, but two years later, my father found his mum. She lived in my home state, in the town of Washington. It wasn't the street's name, it was the town's name. How messed up is that? More than 30 years later, I still have no explanation. This is a story of one of the scariest and strangest things that's ever happened to me. Let me go from the beginning. One morning, I got a lift to work with a lady that I work with. As we were driving, a native bird thuds into the windscreen and bounces off. We both got a fright. I wanted to stop to see if the bird was okay, but the driver insisted on driving on and that it was probably dead. I felt bad. I am an animal lover, but you know what it's like when you have to get to work and time is gonna be tight for the entire day. That night I get home. I'm hanging out in my bedroom when I start hearing what sounds like a person making these groaning and crazy murmuring sounds right outside my bedroom window. I'm home alone and frozen in fear. The sound seems to move around my room to the back of the house until it disappears after about 15 minutes. I didn't look out there because I was scared but I've lived here for over 15 years and have never heard anything like it before or since. That night I wake up from a dead sleep and hear something hiss right in my face. But the creepiness does not end there. A few days later, I'm at someone's home doing some housework for them. They aren't home and I'm alone. And I go to pet their cat, who was sitting aloof on a chair by a huge window on the second story floor that looks out over the driveway. And as I'm looking out the window, this poor little sparrow comes flying straight into the window right in front of me, knocks itself out cold, and falls quite a distance down onto the concrete driveway. I go down to the bird, which seems to be okay, but just in shock. So in order to protect it from the cat, I make a nice little hospital bed for it in a shoebox with air holes and put it safely in the garage to recover for a while. I go upstairs to do the ironing, I'm in a room, standing with my back to the corner, with just the bookshelves behind me. It's very still, and it's a peaceful room with no draught, nor movement coming in from any direction. Nothing. I'm ironing a sheet and thinking back to the bird we hit on our way to work. The creepy as hell noises outside my bedroom, the hiss, and now this bird. Thinking that it's kind of creepy that this bird stuff keeps happening to me. At that very moment, I hear something slide off the bookshelf and fall to the carpet. Guess what it was? It was a heavy ornament of a bird. I stared at it for several seconds, completely perplexed. I promise you it did not just fall off the shelf. I specifically heard it slide. This thing was heavy. I went and let the bird go, which was fine. 
and after that, nothing else happened. This was about five years ago. Was the bird haunting me? I am a 25 year old and live in the UK. I've always believed in the paranormal and have had a few experiences in my life and have been told by a medium that I am sensitive to it. This particular experience happened at my aunt Claire's house when I was around 10. She used to live in a small two bedroom house in a town called Greenhill. Many things happened in this house in the few years that she lived there. And I can safely say I am so glad that she moved away from this awful, accursed home. It started out with small little things, like footsteps being heard when no one was moving around the house, and things moving by themselves, as well as shadows out of the corner of your eye. But things took a pretty sinister turn in the space of a week, when a few key events happened. The first scary thing that occurred was between myself and my aunt's two sons, Tyler and Seb. We spent a lot of time in the backyard playing in the mud and climbing trees. But on this particular day, we opted to dig a hole for some reason. I don't really remember why, but regardless, we dug at the dirt at the bottom of the garden. This garden was long and led to the forest and fields on the back of the house. It was cut off from them with an old rotten wooded fence. We chose to dig in the middle of the trees at a particularly muddy area. And as soon as we hit something hard, we decided to dig it out, assuming as children that it was some lost treasure we were unearthing and that we had hit the jackpot. Instead, as we dug, we found a skull. We screamed for my aunt and mum and showed them and they looked at each other mumbling about being someone's old pet. But at the time I thought nothing of it, but would find out at the age of 18, it was the skull of a baby and that my aunt never managed to find out any information on it, even after taking it to the police. This would then start a chain of events that none of us foresaw. It happened on firework night and myself, Seb, Tyler, Claire, my mum and dad and my aunt's boyfriend were chilling downstairs. All the kids by myself were asleep, when we heard the sound of boots on the floor above us, which was impossible, as we were the only ones home and everyone was accounted for in the living room. My aunt shrugged it off and said that it must be pipes. A while later, I walked past the stairway to get into the kitchen. And from the corner of my eye, I saw something that resembled the large shadow of a man swinging from the ceiling of the landing. I stopped and let out a little shriek and it was gone. My aunt asked me what I'd seen and I told her and she looked sick. I was later to learn that this is a regular occurrence. Along with the occurrence was one that I myself had witnessed when asleep in bed, when we had stayed over for the night as we did often, both the boys would be in bed and you would hear children's laughter and running through the house. Later that night, scratching could be heard throughout the house, but could never be placed as each time you thought you had pinned it, it would move to the opposite wall or area you were at. We were watching a film called Silence of the Lambs, which certainly didn't help the atmosphere. Great film, by the way. And halfway through the film, my dad left to get takeout. So the movie was paused as we all sat laughing and talking when an almighty boom resounded through the house coming from upstairs. We all leaped upstairs, including my sleeping cousins who were woke, startled and confused. We proceeded to follow my aunt's boyfriend upstairs to investigate. And on first glance, nothing seemed to be amiss. All the doors were open and nothing seemed to have fallen. This all changed when my aunt's son, Tyler asked, Mum, what's that? pointing to something laying against the wall. My aunt bent to pick it up and almost threw it at my mum, gasping, my God. I looked at my mum, who was holding a small white and pink laced baby shoe that had small dark patches on it. Everyone had gone as white as a ghost and looked startled. 
I should now say that my aunt had no girls at the time, and the boys were nine and six. This is when my mum looked up and shouted, Claire, the attic's open. How the hell is it open? When I tell you the attic's open, I don't just mean it was unsealed. See, in this house, in the attic, you'd need to push up and slide across to open it. And rarely do they have ladders, at least these houses don't. This particular attic wasn't just open, but the lid had been completely pushed up and moved to the inside of it. So the attic was now completely open and you could see all the darkness above and the shininess of the plastic bin bags ahead. This was insane. As before my aunt had moved in, the attic had been checked and resealed, as the attic was completely empty and had new heat protection in there, so there should be no black bags in there. The reason the opening of the attic was also so terrifying is because the attic had been painted over and sealed with a special sealant to keep it and to stop any draft from coming through it. My aunt's boyfriend then retrieved the bag to find that it was a bag of baby clothes that had never been seen there before and did not belong to my aunt. We were all rushed downstairs and a few hours later my dad and my aunt's boyfriend had a fire going and burnt the shoe on baby clothes. I still today don't know what was on the baby's shoe and I have never wanted to ask for fear of an answer. The story does not end here though. After this event, the feeling in the house got worse and became a dark and scary place to stay. And you could feel as though you were being watched and would often feel someone breathe on your neck. My aunt only managed to cope for a year when she decided to move away and get out the house. Six months after she left, there was a house fire there and the man who lived there sadly passed away. But this got my aunt interested and she looked into the history of the house and was horrified to discover upon researching that the house had a dark past, which had meant that every household had either lost one member or the family in its entirety who occupied it. This is where things started to make sense. The man who lived there before had had severe depression and ended his life on the landing light fixture. The family beforehand had lost members to carbon monoxide poisoning, and the family before that had lost a child and a family pet to a house fire. The record she found only went back so far, but there's still so much unknown about the house. We, however, believe that the house was cursed, and my aunt was lucky to have gotten out alive with her entire family. I know the house is still there, and my ex-fiance lives not too far away from it but I have no desire to go back and find out what happened to anyone else who lived there. And it was a really dark and scary time for me and my aunt. We've never looked back. And personally, I avoid going anywhere near it. The first story I'm going to tell you is a story relayed to me by my late father. And it was something that happened to him and my eldest half-sister when she was a teenager. Allow me to give you some background. My half-sister Giselle had always been able to see ghosts since she was a child. And being able to do so has made her feel like she was cursed. Especially since the entity she sees always appears solid and showed up unexpectedly during the most unexpected of times. My oldest sister Isabel seems to share that curse since she experiences the same thing. I, however, can only see shadows from the corner of my eye as well as feel others' presences when I'm alone. And yet I look, but no one's there. I just pray that I never encounter a ghost up front like my older sisters have. At the time of this event, Giselle was 14 years old and accompanying my father one weekend as she was scouting for a new house to move into since Giselle's mother was pregnant with her sixth child and things were getting cramped in their current residence. My father noticed that Giselle had been clinging to his arm very tightly ever since they entered the front gate and had been glancing around with clear unease. According to my father, the house was a two-story house, comfy looking and quite spacious, only with a few repairs needed in a room or two. 
and the price the owner was giving him was much lower than he had expected it to be. However, my father couldn't shake off the feeling he had as soon as my sister entered the house. The atmosphere felt heavy and so wrong. Add to the fact that Gazelle had seemed reluctant to enter the house and was no longer looking around, but constantly turned to look over her shoulder. As the tour of the house progressed, my father saw that Giselle's unease had melted into complete and utter terror. Her face extremely pale, that he thought at one point she was going to faint, and she practically had his arm in a death grip. Giselle, however, refused to say a word when he asked what was wrong, just shaking her head and practically gluing herself to his side as she trembled. My father knew just by the terrified look on Giselle's face that buying that house would be a mistake. Once the tour was over, my father informed the owner that they wouldn't be buying the house as tempting as the low price was, but thanked him for his time. When my father and Giselle were in the car, he noticed how her eyes were fixed on one of the windows on the second floor, and because he knew that she could see something he couldn't, he asked her what was wrong. My sister tore her dark eyes away from whatever she had been looking at, before turning to him still terrified. Dad? Her normally high-pitched voice was barely a whisper. There was a woman, in black, following us around while we were going through the house. She was floating, and she had a black veil over her head, but I could see her face. It was white, so white, and her eyes, they were pure black, but at the same time, blazing with hatred and she had a snarl on her face and followed us at a distance, but stopped at the foyer after you and I stepped out the door. She was watching us from one of the windows on the second floor just now. She was just filled with hate. My father had started driving as Giselle spoke, and he felt a chill run down his spine once she finished. They didn't bother looking at any other houses that day, despite my father having listed four more to look at because he told me that what Giselle had told him rattled him more than he wanted to admit, and he felt quite drained. I don't even want to think about what would have happened if they'd have bought that house. The next story was told to me by my parents and takes place in a building that my parents and I were residing in shortly after I was born. It seems the building was quite haunted, and they had only learnt about it after moving in. All the people residing there had their own stories to tell. It was just before lunch on the day my parents brought me back from the hospital, and I was asleep in my mother's arms. Just as soon as my parents stepped in their flat and were about to insert the key into the lock, they were startled when something collided with the door, barely missing my father's head. The noise jolted me from my sleep and I began to wail. They whipped their head towards the winding staircase that led to the upper floors, and my father ran to the foot of the stairs to see who had thrown the dirt, but there was no one about, and they would have heard someone running on the tiled floor, or any of the doors slamming, but it was completely silent since it was a weekday and the neighbours were at work. After ushering my mother inside, my father took a look at what had nearly struck him, and saw it was a ball of dirt, compacted perfectly into shapes, as if someone had taken the time to form it and harden it with their hand before hurling it in his direction. My father took a gardening trowel and scooped it up before showing it to my mother who was trying to comfort me since I was still crying up a storm. When the neighbours arrived from work several hours later, they saw my father standing at the foot of the stairs looking up. They asked what was wrong, and he proceeded to tell them the events of the day and showed them the ball of dirt that had caused the fuss. Little things would happen as the months went by. Some that were harmless, others not so. Sometimes when my father was at work and my mother was carrying me as she moved about the house, she noticed how I kept shifting in her arms and laughing, as if there was someone playing peekaboo with me, even though she knew that we were the only ones there. Other times she would hear me squealing with delight in my crib when she had her back to me. And when she turned around, I would be reaching into the air as if trying to grab something. 
One night, while both my parents were laying in bed, gazing at me as I slept between them, they heard the unmistakable sound of someone walking into the bedroom and stopped outside the door. They heard the unmistakable sound of the doorknob rattling, as if someone was trying to get in but the door was locked. The rattling stopped, only to be followed by a light knocking. My father turned on the bedroom light, demanding to know who it was. The knocking stopped and there was only silence. Nothing else happened that night. However, neither of my parents got any sleep. The next morning they checked all the doors and windows and everything was locked. We moved out of that place that same weekend. My husband and I bought a townhouse back in September of 2017 and we've had super weird things happen since. Most of these experiences have happened on our second story. For background, where the stairs come up to my office is immediately to the left. Then there is a long hall to the right with the hallway bathroom. The laundry room just past that is my son's room on the other side and the master bedroom at the very end of the hall. The access to the attic is in the master bedroom closet. As our family goes, it's me, my husband, our son, and our two large dogs. When we first moved in, our son was barely three years old and had just started making full sentences. He would be playing all day without any issues, but whenever it started to get dark outside, he began getting nervous and wouldn't want to be in his room. He'd come downstairs at one point saying, Mummy, do you hear it? Hear what, kiddo? The baby's crying, mummy. My son is an only child, so you can imagine my confusion at this time. I came upstairs with him and asked him where he was hearing him from, thinking he may be hearing the neighbors through the wall. He took my hand and pulled me towards the master bedroom, stopping just a short over the threshold. He pointed to the darkest corner of the room and said, over there, the baby's crying over there. My body went numb. I tried to brush it off and told him there's no baby there and he's just imagining it. This persisted for about a month before he finally stopped talking about the crying baby. During this time, I had been doing research on our house and there had been no deaths in that house that I could find, let alone any kids that lived in the house before us. A few weeks after my son stopped mentioning the baby, I started hearing scratching noises above my head in the attic. I told my husband and he thought we had raccoons or some other animal living in the attic. He went up a few days later, but found nothing. I'm normally a heavy sleeper, but at least twice a week I would wake up to hear a faint scratching noise directly above me. I did my best to try and ignore it and go back to sleep. This seemed to work as we hadn't had an issue for a while up until recently. I have always felt somewhat uneasy on the second floor, but I just attributed it to my past paranormal experiences growing up and being a little paranoid. Now, I'm thinking my senses were on point. A few months ago, my husband and I were talking about how our son had this weird affinity for the crying baby when he was younger. And I had mentioned that one day when I was taking a nap, I woke up abruptly being sideways on the bed with one leg hanging off towards the closet, almost like I was being dragged towards it. However, I don't remember being pulled at all. All I do is flop around a lot in my sleep. So I brushed it off. After I told my husband about this, he frowned a little bit and said he had a weird experience too recently. Apparently, he woke up one morning around 2.30 a.m. and saw a figure standing by his side of the bed. He said it was all black and he couldn't really make out a face or any distinct features. He went to kick the figure, thinking maybe someone had broken into the house and his foot went right through it. This freaked him out a little bit. But he's a firm believer that if you don't acknowledge paranormal things, they can't do anything. So of course he rolls over and goes to sleep and doesn't even think to mention it to me until I told him about my own experience. 
The whole time we've been here, the dogs will randomly get spooked or will stare at something that I don't see. Every once in a while, our wolf hybrid, who's typically scared of his own shadow, will get very upset and his hair will stand on end and he will emit a low but vicious growl. Our other dog is a Malinois slash black lab mix, but she's getting old and is 10 years old now and doesn't really do much other than sleep on her bed and try to get all the pets and treats from us. And this brings us to the present. Yesterday, there was a decent storm that came through our area. It was semi dark out and thunder every once in a while. I'm working from home during the virus pandemic and my mum had come to pick up my son around 1130 so that I could work in peace without my son continually bothering me. A few hours later, I'm listening to a podcast while working and I hear a faint mumble that almost sounded like mommy. The chilling thing is that it sounded exactly like my son. I turned around to tell him that he needed to go back to his room and not bother me while I was working. But as I was turning, I remembered he wasn't even home. I was here alone with the dogs. There was no one behind me and no one down the hall. At this point, I try to brush it off, thinking my mind is playing a trick on me. When my wolf hybrid starts losing it, all his hair stands on end. He gets between me and the door and starts doing this low ground. This freaked me out a little bit, but I told him to stop, which he listened to and laid back down, but without taking his eyes off the hallway. About an hour later, I was in the zone with work and was talking to a coworker on our team chat. They sent me something funny enough to make me audibly laugh. I then heard a tiny giggle that sounds exactly like my son coming from his room down the hall, who still isn't home at this point. I nearly fall out of my chair with how scared I was. I got up and checked all the rooms upstairs, but I was home alone like I had thought. I had to get back to work as we were starting to get busy, but I was on edge and straining to hear if anything else was happening behind me. 10 minutes later, I hear the crash of something relatively small, but still loud downstairs. My dogs run down the steps while I follow behind them. My PlayStation controller, which was originally on the charging stand behind the TV, was in the middle of the living room floor. This made my blood run cold, as we had not had anything physically moved yet. And I was having a full blown panic attack. I called my husband who was already on his way home and said he would be there soon. When he got home, everything seemed to have stopped. This all happened from two to 430 in the middle of a little thunderstorm. I've looked into it. And from what I can gather when something can mimic voices, it's typically evil or demonic. Should I be worried? What do I do in this situation? I don't want to scare my son and we can't move. But I'm extremely paranoid and scared to be home alone right now. When I was five, me and my identical twin sister, both caught scarlet fever. We are from America. But my dad's project had temporarily relocated us to India and we were not used to the water and food there. We both fell into a coma towards the end of the fever. One day, I woke up, and my mum and aunt were screaming and crying and holding my sister, because she was unresponsive and not breathing. They were doing chest compressions, CPR and the like, but nothing was working. I was desperately trying to get their attention because I was young and didn't understand what was going on. I went back to my room to go back to sleep. But in the corner of my room where my sister's bed was, I saw her laying there breathing fine. I went back out to the living room and realized I was looking at myself in my mum's arms as she tried to revive me. Eventually, I saw my eyes flicker open and then everything went dark. I woke up a few weeks later in the hospital next to my sister and my mum, 
who ended up catching it because of us. My mum told me I had almost passed, and they were trying to wake me up, but I was unresponsive. So the ambulance took all three of us into the ICU. To this day, I'm still unsure how I witnessed my almost death. When my brother and I were much younger, we'd have to stay at my grandparents when my mum and dad went on vacation. This happened a lot, as my dad's company would allow my mum to go with him on business trips. There was only ever one guest bedroom in my grandparents' room, so my brother and I had to share a double bed. My brother always fought with me about who had to sleep near the edge of the bed, as the other side was against a wall. I always lost and would settle in for a sleepless night. The only way I can describe it is every night, an hour after I got to bed, someone would sit down next to me. It never made me feel threatened, but it was always creepy to be hummed songs and have my hair moved. One night I had enough of it and had to get out of the room. As I walked out into the living room, I saw my grandfather sitting in his favorite chair. He looked up at me and asked if Ben and June had awoken me. I quickly asked who Ben was and what he was talking about. His story quickly unfolded. During his first marriage, he had a son who would have been 23 and engaged. Him and his fiance came to visit one night and slept in the room. They left late that night after arguing profusely. My grandfather overheard that June was pregnant and didn't want to scare Ben. On the way home, they were hit by a drunk driver and both passed away. I went back to sleep, leaving my grandfather muttering for a good hour or more out in the living room. Sometime after he went to sleep and I felt the familiar presence sit on the side of the bed with me. To be clear, my brother and I fought about it because he felt the same thing and we never wanted to sleep on that side of the bed. He always assumed I never noticed it. My mother and her cousins often played together as children. Although as a rule, none of them were supposed to be out after dark. One day when she was around six or seven years old, she and three of her cousins were playing hide and seek. They were enjoying themselves so much, they didn't notice the sun was starting to set while the full moon was rising. Mama was it during this game, and after she finished counting, she went looking for her cousins. She found most of them, except Linda. After some time, Mama found Linda hiding behind a tree near a shaded area in the forest that was a little deeper than she was used to going. Even if it was near her house, it was quite unusual since she and the other children had been told by the adults to never go deep into the woods because they could get lost or taken by the spirits of the forest. Even though Mama was still a child, she could see why the adults had warned her and the other children away from the deeper parts with bamboo, mango and other trees. It would be dark in some places, even in broad daylight. But now that it was night, it was beyond pitch black and Mama was starting to get the creeps. Psst. Startled, Mama looked to her left and thanks to a sliver of moonlight that managed to peek through some of the branches overhead, saw Linda partially hidden behind a tree. She had a mischievous grin on her face and was beckoning to Mama to come closer. Linda. My mother was flabbergasted. What are you doing there? We're not supposed to go beyond the tree line and you're not supposed to be giving away your hiding spot. Linda didn't answer, only continued to silently beckon to mama, but she didn't move. A chill ran down her spine and began to spread through her body as she continued to stare at her cousin. Something wasn't right. She knew it. Her cousin's normally chubby face looked angular, elongated, and her mischievous smile became sinister as she emerged from her place behind the tree. 
which she soon realized was a ballet tree, notorious for being the residence of evil spirits. She also noticed that Linda seemed to be growing taller with each step, and even though she wanted to run, she couldn't even move and barely scream. The figure that had taken her cousin's face lurched forward, bending over so that it almost resembled a hunchbacked witch, its eyes gleaming. Suddenly the sound of rustling leaves and snapping twigs broke the silence, A mama felt someone grab her shoulder before she was yanked backwards away from the evil that intended to steal her away. When she looked up at her saviour, she found herself looking into the eyes of her uncle Simon, who was Linda's father. He had one hand on his shoulder as he moved to stand between her and the sharpshooter that wore his daughter's face with a machete in his other hand. Mama peered around him and found the being backing away slowly until it fully disappeared into the shadows from whence it came. Without a word, her uncle picked her up with one arm and carried her back the way she had come. While she hid her face in his shoulder, not wanting to look at the darkness that could have been her grave. After some time, she found herself being carried into the threshold of her home, her parents looking furious, her various aunts and uncles worried, looking at her. All her cousins from earlier, Linda included, were sitting on the bamboo seats, trembling, with tears running down their faces. After her uncle Simon set her down, he asked her what happened and why she had gone that deep into the forest. She explained what happened, noticing the terrified looks on the cousins' faces as they listened while the adults became even more tense than they had already been. When she was done recounting her experience, her uncle Simon told her that Linda had encountered someone she thought was Mama while she was hiding, only to realize it wasn't her. She had run screaming from her hiding place, telling him and the others what she'd seen. And when they found Mama's slipper, which she hadn't realized she'd lost while searching, Uncle Simon had told Linda's elder sister to take her and the other children to my grandparents. My mother and her cousins got quite a scolding for playing past sundown, but Mama always felt that it was worth it, since she wouldn't have been alive to tell the tale if Uncle Simon had gotten there a few minutes later. Ever since that night, she's always made sure to keep an eye on the sun when she has her cousins playing, so that they can go in before dark. The next story takes place in my father's ancestral home in his hometown, which is a place where no one wants to try and make a life beyond its boundaries. The house is now abandoned and lies in ruins. These events took place three to four years before he passed away. I was already an adult in my late twenties. I was temporarily staying there with my father while waiting for news on the various job applications I had sent out online since my last job in the city had stressed me out so much, my health had gone downhill, so I had to leave to recuperate. The house was already old and in the state of disrepair, and I have to tell you I was praying for the day that I could leave, because not only were we living a hand-to-mouth existence, but my father is domineering and has a controlling attitude. It was really grating on my nerves. He kept rubbing it in my face that we were surviving on his retirement pension, since I was too weak to hold the job for a year, and he even had the audacity to tell me that I should let him manage the inheritance from my late mother's estate once it was released. He wanted to use it to set up a business, mainly because he wanted me to live out my days in that dead-end town that he called home when nothing happened and no one wanted to leave their comfort zone. What he didn't know was that I would never let him touch what was mine. I was basically the maid at home doing all the cooking, cleaning, laundry, the works. I was also constantly being humiliated by our father to the relatives that we have and acquaintances, since I am and still mostly a loner. The only people I could really talk to being a few cousins who were also outcasts like me. He may have been my father, but he should never have been allowed to raise kids, since loving and nurturing has never been something he understood. It was always about control, 
You are his puppet, doing his bidding. As I mentioned, the house was old and falling into disrepair. At the time of this story that I'm about to tell you, it was no secret that the house was haunted. Even when my grandparents and other cousins resided there during my high school days. But they aren't the ones I'm going to share with you. On many occasions, I would see people walking through the house, but when I would turn to look at them, there was no one there. The passing visitors weren't just limited to human beings. Many times I even saw the animals. I had one come close to me, visit after their precious lives had been cruelly cut short, all in the name of finger foods that should have been eaten to go with the booze. It was almost as if my four-legged friends were coming to see me one last time before going to their eternal reward. And when I told my cousins, whom I was close to about them, they said it was because those creatures remembered the kindness I had showed to them and knew that I loved them. There was one apparition in particular that seemed to follow me around all the time, that of a little boy, about three years old. When I would be cleaning the yard, I'd see him from the corner of my eyes sitting on a bench or standing a few feet away watching me. However, he would be gone once I turned my head to look at him. Whenever I was in the kitchen preparing a meal, he would be peering at me from around the kitchen door. He was mostly a blurry figure, like what you see on the old TV screens when the signal's bad, and I could never see his face, but knew he was there. Once around dusk, my father was out talking to his friends and I was upstairs folding the clothes that I had gotten off the clothesline since they were dry. And from the corner of my eye, I saw that child and he began to inch closer to me, as if curious as to what I was doing. I didn't feel threatened by him, and spoke to him gently, hoping that I could give him comfort in some way. The next day, I went to my cousin Leela's house. She and her siblings, along with their mother, Susan, a fellow outcast like me, but for different reasons. Technically, they're paying for a sin that was committed by their matriarch. Susan is my eldest cousin on my father's side, so Leela and her siblings are my nieces. Leela, though, is my age, and Anna is five years my junior, but I look at them all as cousins, no big deal. I told Leela, her younger sister Anna, and their mother Susan about the little boy I kept on seeing, and they all became very quiet before exchanging a long look. Leela told me that it's known behind closed doors that Susan's half-sister Victoria had several extramarital affairs and many abortions afterwards. The latter were all performed at the ancestral house. They said that the little boy might be one of the children who paid for their mother's sins with their lives. And he clearly took a liking to me because even though I'm not a mother, I'd never hurt a child. That little boy was my constant companion when I wasn't visiting Leela up until June 2014, when I started a new job in a city almost 12 hours away from where my father lived. Leela and Anna were also able to start a new chapter of their lives in a city 13 hours away from that pit we were stuck to, two months after I left. We still keep in touch and remain close as ever, because in my eyes, they, along with the maternal uncle, I have a soft spot, and my sister and her three children are the only family I have left now. My father passed February 2016, and when I went to attend the funeral service and tie up the loose ends he had left, I saw the house had continued to deteriorate after I was gone, and I was glad. I had always felt like the life and whatever courage I had to try to hold on to after my mother died when I was 12 was being drained from me the entire time I'd stayed there. The house is now in ruins, completely abandoned, and the trees and plants that thrived when I was there have since withered. My parents got divorced when I was about 12. Some minor things happened in the first few places we lived in. We moved into this apartment complex when I was about 14. The manager ever so kindly let us know that the previous tenant passed away. Well, isn't that just lovely? So in that apartment, a lot of weird stuff happened. 
Once a big glass Pyrex measuring cup fell off the counter and shattered on the floor. I had made sure I put it down no less than five inches away from the edge. My cat had been sleeping on the couch the entire time. My cat used to mess up the lower cabinet doors, making them open a bit then close with a bang. One night I woke up because the cabinet doors were banging around. I got up, dragged my exhausted ass to the kitchen and yelled at her to stop. But I didn't see her anywhere in the kitchen. And then I remembered she wasn't even in my apartment. We had taken her up to my grandmother's earlier that week. When I was 16, I was sitting in the living room with my then boyfriend, being silly and taking pictures with a digital camera. Every picture we had taken that afternoon were all weird. There were orbs, drastic lighting changes and weird streaks of light and faces reflected in the computer monitor that was off and the faces didn't belong to either of us. To debunk the pictures, I cleaned up the camera lens, cleaned the monitor and made sure the lamp wasn't being too glitchy and took a few more pictures. The orbs and faces didn't reappear but the weird lighting and streaks did. I set the camera down because it freaked me out. And the next day when I wanted to show my best friend the pictures, they were all gone. All but one of me and my boyfriend sitting next to each other. Never could explain it. That was about 10 years ago. And I'm still dealing with a lot of weird stuff that's happening in the house I currently live in. I've never seen shadow people from my peripheral vision. They're always a few feet away from me, but right in front of my field of vision. I've only ever seen them at night when my room is quite dark. Generally something rouses me in my sleep. I'll open my eyes and there it is, a dark humanoid figure, which I always initially assume is a family member out of bed and trying to awake me for some reason. I'll then ask them what they're doing or why they awoke me. But when they say nothing and remain still, I'll grow annoyed and continue repeating my questions until they just gradually dissolve before my very eyes. This is the moment where the fear sinks in. And I realize this clearly wasn't the family member I thought I was just aggressively speaking to. My point here is that these dark humanoid figures are already present so I don't see how they materialize in the first place. As I lay beneath my covers, I kept my eyes on the corner of my room at the foot of my bed. As I stared into the patch of darkness and shadow where the two walls met, I felt like my eyes were playing tricks on me because it looked as if the shadow was undulating. I kept my eyes fixed to the space and slowly but surely the shadow grew larger and morphed into this big, dark, round humanoid figure. I say rounded because it was kind of like a featureless, heavyset Santa body made out of super dark shadow. I'd never seen anything like this before. He was wearing a hat. He had a kind of large sombrero and just stood there motionless once manifested and seemed to be made completely from shadow as though the thing just pulls in and sucks in a patch of deep shadow from a space in the room and uses that to form his space. It was a really trippy experience and I was a kid and quite scared and remained stock still, staring in shock for at least 20 seconds, trying to gain the courage to scream out to my parents in the next room. I still remember counting to three in my head before I finally had the guts to scream Mom. I closed my eyes while screaming. So this time I wasn't able to watch the thing depart or dissolve. My parents took mere seconds to enter my room. And once they were there, my eyes opened and I looked straight back into the corner and the thing was gone. I never saw one like that again. The others are always quite skinny. One thing for sure though, each time I've had an encounter with a shadow person, even though I've now had quite a few, I'm always equally and unsuspecting at the time before, and I always feel the same initial frustration while not receiving a response. 
right up until that cold fear takes over upon their eerie and unexplainable departure. I am the youngest of four brothers, all a year apart. At this time I was about nine, and our family friend was spending the night at our place. We lived in a two-story house with a basement. At this time, my mother was single and dating a lot. So during this particular night, she was away. We saw how to make a Ouija board on this episode of a show called Mystery Hunters, a Canadian kids channel, YTV. So we decided it would be a fun thing to try while we had the house to ourselves. So we cut up an old cardboard box and made a Ouija board from it. We put felt on the bottom of the triangle thing so that it would slide better and it worked pretty well. We all tried putting our fingers on the triangle and asking questions, but got no response. Then me and my brother asked a question to the likes of, is there a demon here? And the triangle started to move. We looked at each other and the expression on our faces showed that it was neither of us moving the triangle. We immediately got scared and ran into the kitchen. When we got there, we heard a crash come from the living room. It sounded like our TV fell off the wall unit. But when we ran back, we saw that nothing was wrong. After this, we decided to grab a Bible and read. The first words we read in unison were, God's people are doomed. Frightened by this, we turned on the TV and saw it was Dave Chappelle, so we assumed it was going to be something funny. But when the audio began, the first words from Dave were, and all the people died, to which the audience started laughing, and then it went to a commercial. Freaked out by both of these strange and unlikely things happening, the waterworks began, and we got up and ran upstairs crying and screaming to my brother's bedroom. When we got up the stairs and into his bedroom, we heard footsteps that sounded exactly like ours run up the stairs after us. Immediately, I assumed it was one of my brothers or our friends late up the stairs. But then we realized we were all in the room and no one passed by the door. We began to panic. So we held each other freaking out. It's hard to say if we heard anything after this point. So this was the last that happened for now. Two hours later, me and my brother, the bravest of the four, decided that this might be all in our heads and that we would go play video games on my mum's computer in her office, Diablo 2 to be exact. The door to her office had no handle, so my brother pushed the door open and immediately after he pushed the door, it slammed back on his arm and all the way from the basement, we heard clear and loud laughter. The only way I can describe it is it was the sound of a witch that echoed through the entire house. At this point, we ran down the stairs, out the door into my grandmother's house, which was down the street and waited for mum to come home. I'm not sure if she completely believed us, but this was when we were kids. I'm 23 years old now, and this story sticks out as the only and craziest paranormal experience I have ever had. When I was about 12, I lived in a house on the outskirts of Havre, Montana. It was just me and my parents, a small two-story house with a little attic. Both me and my parents stayed on the second floor, their bedroom right next to mine. And there was a closet and bathroom up there too. There was a second bedroom on the bottom floor that we used as a storage room all my life, I have been more susceptible to seeing and sensing things. So the first day that we were at the house, I kept getting this strange feeling throughout. And this would persist the entire time we lived there. While we still had all our stuff piled around the house, we would notice that sometimes things wouldn't be where we had last left them. We would also hear noises downstairs like knocks and bumps and other things the kind of stuff that's normal in a house. But after about a month of living there, things like doors would open and shut and footsteps would be heard throughout the house. At night, 
I wouldn't be able to sleep because there would be noises in the attic. After a few months, things started turning violent. Things would fly off the counter, and doors would slam shut, and the footsteps turned into stomping. My dad got shoved down the stairs one time. There was one night that I will never forget. I kept my door open because I didn't want to be woken up if it was opened. It slammed shut at some point in the night. I don't remember what time it was, but there was a huge bang coming from every wall in the ceiling. It was so intense that pictures fell off the wall. I screamed for my parents, and it stopped. And they came running in and asked me what was wrong. I asked if they'd heard the banging, and they all said they hadn't. I was so scared and confused. I slept with my parents for a while after that. Things kept happening. A glass was thrown at my mum, and I got locked in a storage room. After a while, my parents figured something was very wrong with the house, so they sold it and we moved to where I'm living now. I still think about that house and the things that went on there, and I'm glad that I'm never going back. I've got an interesting story I would like to share with you. So, family from my mother's side have been having some strange events happen to them. My maternal grandfather talked about his mum and dad standing around him three days before he passed, and the day he did die, he told my aunt that his parents were in the room, and telling him that he would be joining them at two thirty that night. He breathed his last that hour. My maternal uncle woke up suddenly in the dead of night, and his wife asked him where did he think he was going at three in the morning. He replied that his mother was outside asking him to come over to her. He died within twenty minutes. My late mother asked me once who was the third person besides you and your father, as you were talking to me. I replied, no one. Later, she said her parents were there, saying that she would be with them shortly. And that they would have to come and take her. Some time later, she named a few more folks standing around her, and passed away shortly after. But the strangest of all these occurrences is that of a 28-year-old man, the son of a very close family friend of my parents-in-law. It baffles me to this day. He was visiting his parents on leave from Moscow, where he was stationed as part of a MNC staff. His younger sister was getting married, and the house was packed with guests. He woke up at 12:30 at night. Was a bit panicky. His Russian wife called in his elder brother, who found his youngest brother crying in a state of panic. The younger man asked for his mother, and once she arrived, asked for her to stay with him, since they would arrive at four in the morning to take him. The guy was clean, had always been drug-free. His elder brother suggested they visit a hospital. And let them run whatever tests they need to. Maybe he was suffering from something, and perhaps it was just a nightmare. But he agreed and insisted that his mother came along. They brought him to a nearby facility. The ER docs and nurses were skeptical, but they ran the tests anyway. Alcohol, drugs, EKG, and a few others—all normal. They told him that he was as fit as a fiddle and could proceed home. However, the young man was still panicky. And at the insistence of the family, the hospital agreed to detain him until morning. A few minutes before 4 a.m., he said, "They have arrived. They are tall, many of them in white robes. Their faces are covered, and they are angels. They are all surrounding my bed, and the room is full of them." At precisely 4 a.m., he went limp, ceased breathing, and was declared dead. I had been experiencing many strange sounds and feelings last year. My cousin had a party at my house, and without my knowledge, had brought a Ouija board and played it. Keep in mind that my room is in the basement, and every sound in the house can be heard from there. Most of the time, I can tell exactly what it is. It was just me, my mum, and sister, and two dogs in the house. I had been hearing loud footsteps all around the house. Mostly when it was just me home, and they were heavy, like a man's footsteps, too heavy to be my mum or my sister. 
and I began to smell this rancid smell floating around the house. I'll be downstairs cleaning the basement, and it'll pass by me so suddenly, I had actually thought I made it up. Then I'd be anywhere else in the house, and I'll just settle for a few minutes, and it'll pass by once again. This strange occurrence happened for several weeks, and it progressed to random objects flying off the shelves at one point, and a cup almost hit me as I was walking past my bookshelf. Two months after the first incident, I started seeing a dark, shadowy silhouette in the basement just across from my room. Now I'm not one that scares easily, but after so many weeks of these incidents, I had increasingly become more and more paranoid, and so seeing it for the first time, I was so scared. I couldn't shut my door fast enough. It was like that every night, seeing it in the same spot. Soon enough, I began to see it all around my house, down the hallway, in the dining room, and despite being afraid, I tried to ignore it. Because if I didn't feed into what it wanted, it couldn't hurt me, or so I thought. About two to three weeks after seeing it for the first time, I had woken up with a scabbing and scratching sensation down my back. Slight bruising as well. That was the only case of there ever being anything physical. Sometime after that, I had a dream involving the entity. In the dream, I was standing on the dock, watching the water, when I noticed a child standing at the end of it. The little boy fell in, and I had run to him, jumping in the water after him. But all I saw was the child being dragged under, only its eyes were dark and hollow. It was like big pools of dark ink. Then as I'm trying to grab for him, I had this feeling of dread. Then I'm grabbed and faced with the same entity. Only this time I can actually see its face, pale and white, with the same black eyes like empty sockets, its face stuck in this silent scream. As I woke up, I had sleep paralysis and started going through some of the steps I have to do to get out of it. After that, the incident slowly died away, until finally I had a friend of mine cleanse the house and do a blessing. Ever since then, I haven't had any more occurrences. I'm just not sure how to make sense of all of this. My sister, age 12, recently came to me and described feeling uncomfortable in certain areas of the house, and said she'd been seeing the same dark silhouette of the same woman that I used to see. She also has been having nightmares of this entity watching her sleep and following her around. I still have not had any more experiences. I was wondering what anyone thought about why she's suddenly being affected after so long. I'm a native of Long Island, New York which as you may know, has been settled for a long time and has a lot of little old towns, especially on the eastern end of the island. We even have some revolutionary war history. At the time of this story, I was seeing a guy from the local area and one night he took me to a bar called the Checkmate Inn in Setiket because some friends of his worked there and it was supposed to be this cool old local spot with a few interesting stories. It used to be a private home and sits on a barely lit single lane road winding through rows of tall trees. It actually still looks like an old house and even has a cellar where they store the alcohol. Its second story has been converted into some apartments above the bar area and staff sometimes rent them out. Across the street from the checkmate is the Thompson House, an old wooden structure built in 1709, belonging to a doctor during the Revolutionary War, and is now a museum of colonial medicine. We got there before the big rush of customers showed up, and we were able to talk with one of his buddies who tended the bar that evening. Somehow the subject of ghost stories came up. My date's buddy told me that he'd rented one of the upstairs apartments and had some weird experiences up there. 
There had been a few nights when he'd awoken at 3 a.m. to see a shadow standing on the opposite side of the bedroom, or being alone in the apartment at night and hearing footsteps passing through the other rooms, having glass beer bottles suddenly slide off the kitchen table and crash to the floor, or witnessing his bedroom curtains waving wildly as if blown by a strong wind, only to find that the windows were closed and locked. One night he woke up in the darkness to see an old man leaning over his bed, looking furiously angry. Thinking someone had broken in, he yelled at the man and sat up. But in that moment, the man vanished. His brother had worked at the bar and rented one of the apartments before him as well, and reportedly saw not only the shadowy figure of an old man, but also what appeared to be a young woman in a pale dress in his bedroom at night. He never got a good look at her face though. Apparently the brother's girlfriend had stayed there with him overnight a few times and had seen the woman as well. The bartender had worked at the checkmate for about a year at that time. And while he no longer rented the apartment there, he continued to have strange things happen to him while on the job. The most active part of the building was the old cellar. He said it's very dark and cool down there, and several times he'd gone down to grab another keg of beer or bottles of liquor, and had bottles flung at him when he was the only one down there. He'd also been pushed on the stairs while carrying bottles once. His co-workers also told stories of having an uneasy feeling in the cellar, and having kegs rolled across the room suddenly, or having bottles thrown at them. When they went to confront, Whoever was on shift with them at the time, they were always in another part of the building and denied playing jokes. He wasn't sure about the history of the house or whether anyone had passed away there though. The home is from the mid 1800s, so I'm not sure if it had many overs through the years. While I love ghost stories and so did my date, we didn't find them so much scary as thought provoking and entertaining. We enjoyed the rest of our night and went to leave at about 2.30 in the morning. Most of the patrons had left at that point, with just two or three stragglers hanging out on the back deck. We each had driven ourselves to the bar and I had parked on the side of the road, in front of the old Thompson house. We stood in front of the house talking for several minutes, and then shared a long kiss. Suddenly both of us were startled by a very loud thump right next to us. We pulled apart and I started looking around for what could have made the noise. A few feet away, rolling towards the road was a huge rock, almost the size of a cantaloupe. I was trying to be brave and picked it up. It must have weighed five or six pounds. I was pissed, thinking one of his friends at the bar had thrown it at us as an incredibly mean and unfunny joke. No one was around, and as we had been standing around for a while, we would have seen anybody crossing the road. The checkmate is set about a hundred yards from the road, and then off to the side is the patio. If someone had thrown it from across the street, they'd have to have been a shot put champ to hurl a six pound rock almost 200 yards. And even then, why was the rock bouncing quickly towards the road? None of the few remaining bar patrons had moved from their seats and no one was up or moving around on the other side of the road. It looked as if it had been thrown from the direction of the dark woods surrounding the Thompson house. I walked around the property expecting to find someone hiding in the bushes, but I didn't see or hear anything. Neither of us had seen or heard anyone walking around. It was a still night on a quiet road and unable to come up with an explanation. We were both pretty freaked out and decided that was our cue to leave. Something around there was clearly not happy with PDA. I'm no longer seeing the guy, as I haven't gone back there since. But one day when the COVID lockdown is over, I'd like to go back and see if any of the current bar staff have any new stories to tell. Besides, it's a fun local bar and a good spot for a low key night out. Next story. I now live in Northern Virginia, and as it so happens, the Gettysburg battlefield is only about an hour and a half drive away from where I currently reside. If you've ever heard the stories, 
the battlegrounds and the surrounding neighbourhoods are supposed to be extremely haunted. They have some fantastic ghost tours there, and the town and battlefields have their own sort of aura about them. Even without hearing the stories, I went on a ghost tour one night with a friend of mine. At one point in the tour, we arrived at a creek on the edge of town. The story as told by our guide was that on the second day of the battle, a group of wounded Union soldiers had taken refuge in the creek bed, which was dry in the middle of summer. Many of them were badly injured and unable to move. Unfortunately, the summer storm came through and it began to rain heavily, flooding the creek bedding and drowning all of the wounded men. Not one of them survived, according to the tale. Well, it was night time when I stood there, and pitch black. I hung back as the tour group moved on to their next stop and looked around. There's a lot of long grasses and cattails growing along the creek now, and I decided just for the fun of it to take some pictures of them in the dark. I had flash on, and of course I made sure that there was no one in front of me or around me at the time. I really didn't expect anything, but figured why not. The next day as I got home, I was looking through my tour photos and in one of the pictures I had taken of the creek, you can see the reeds and cattails very clearly, lit up by the flash, floating above them, and the upper hand corner of the picture, dim but still very visible was a face. It was the side view of a man's face, and you could easily make out a blue cap from the front of a blue collared coat and yellow buttons. The forehead, eyes, nose, and parts of the chin, as well as what would appear to be dark hair under the cap were very distinct. Remember again that this face is floating above the tall plants in the creek, and while not transparent, it does seem to be lit up by the flash. The two other photos I took of the same spot within seconds of each other had nothing on it. The blue military looking coat and cap made me wonder if this could have been the apparition of a Union soldier hanging around the spot where he'd tragically drowned. I showed the photo to a few people without pointing anything out to them, and every one of them immediately noticed the face. The third story here was told to me by a friend of mine who hails from Michigan. She was in a sorority during her undergrad years, and one of the sorority chapter houses had a ghostly legend attached to it. Apparently a former sister had graduated and returned to the university years later as a professor. I'm not sure of the details, but her life was brutally ended in her home one night, and I don't think the killer was ever caught. Since then, the sorority house, where she had spent so much of her time of her life in, has been the site of disembodied footsteps, doors opening and closing, lamps turning on and off by themselves, and generally only when one of the sisters was alone in the house at night. She claims that many of the sisters she knew had experiences like this. One day a visitor of one of the sorority's national councils came for a visit and stayed at the house. Not being from the local area, she decided to do some sightseeing in a nearby city and brought her GPS with her. This was several years ago before everyone had a GPS on their phones. She had kept the GPS in her room at the sorority house that day and used it to navigate the city. On her way in, she experienced no problems and found her destination without difficulty. On her way home later that night, she plugged in the address to the house and soon noticed that her return route bore no resemblance to the one she'd taken earlier in the day. After many unfamiliar twists and turns, the GPS told her that she had arrived at her destination. The problem was she had not arrived at the sorority house, but a cemetery. After messing around with the device and re-entering the address, she finally found her way back to the sorority house and explained to one of the hosts what had transpired. Upon revealing the name of the cemetery, she was informed that it just so happened to be the one that the murdered former sister was buried in. I would like to share a story. In Croxley near Watford, Hertfordshire in the UK, there's a moorland with a river running along it. 
Halfway down the moor, walking west, the river juts to the right, northwest, and the bank rises up a metre or so. On a hot, bright summer day, I was walking along towards the raised bank of the river. As I got to the peak, I looked into the river, and there was a man in there. He was big, six foot four if anything, long bearded and quite fat, in the water up to his waist and apparently naked. He looked at me with shock on his face, as if I had startled him, or he hadn't expected to be caught having a dip. So as to not embarrass him, and because I was unconcerned, I waved a hand casually and kept walking along the bank. I intended to look away, and kept looking away, allowing him to salvage his modesty. But the river turns up the bank, and so I had to turn, no more than three paces on, and it was clear from peripherals that he had gone. I was standing on a high bank, slightly elevated over the surrounding land. I can see both ways along the river for over a hundred meters, and he's just vanished. There was nowhere he could have gone. He wasn't underwater either. It's barely way steep and slowly moving and clear. He never even left a ripple in the water. It took me several minutes to accept he hadn't been real despite seeing him for no more than three meters away, in bright sunlight. I didn't realize he was a ghost until he vanished, and that made him the oddest ghost I had ever seen. Since I can remember, my mum saw things that no one else could, and knew things she couldn't ever have known. I'm not sure if I could call her a medium. To my knowledge, she's never actually tried to communicate with the dead. My mum never really liked to talk about it. And whenever I tried to talk about these things, she would quickly change the subject. However, she did tell me the spirits she sees or senses are all around us and are mostly neutral. The few instances of an evil presence she encountered scared her so much, she hoped that none of her children would have the same ability. I'm definitely not as sensitive as my mother. However, I do have a few strange experiences of my own. Today, I would like to share them with you. At the time I was around 15 years old, I live in Poland with my parents and two younger siblings in an apartment on the fourth floor. There was this older lady with some kind of mental disability living in the neighborhood. I never saw her before that day. She probably seldom left the house. That afternoon, I was doing my hair in the bathroom when I heard noises coming from the apartment door. Someone was trying to get inside, knocking and pulling on the door handle. My stepdad and my siblings were at home with me, but my mom was out for some reason. I now do not remember. Thinking it may be her though, I opened the door. The moment I did, I saw an old wrinkled lady with foggy eyes and gray hair try to push past me into the apartment. At that moment, I thought I saw a ghost. I stopped her by blocking the way with my body and asked how I could help her. She was visibly shaken, and her adult diaper was pulled down around her ankles. She began crying and yelling that her son is trying to kill her because she didn't want to give him money for alcohol. She said he grabbed her by the neck and attempted to strangle her. I looked over her shoulder, but I did not see anyone chasing her. As this was a bizarre situation, I really didn't know what to do. So I called out to my stepdad. He walked the old lady back home and told me later she's bipolar or something akin, and that she was probably just confused. I'm not sure what to do about it, as her son was indeed an alcoholic and the situation did not seem too implausible. My mum later told me the lady would sometimes come to our apartment thinking it was her place, as she lived in the neighboring apartment block also on the fourth floor, but I never saw her again. Fast forward two years or so, I'm taking a shower, and suddenly I get this very weird sensation. I remember randomly the foggy-eyed old lady, and I knew that she had passed. 
As they got out the shower, the strange feeling lingered, and then all the toiletries and cosmetics began falling off the shelves. What was really weird is that some just fell straight down to the ground and some flew in different directions. If someone asked me before this incident what I would do if I saw things moving on their own, I probably would have said I would have noped out of there in a second and never come back. But I was not scared. I started calmly picking up everything and putting it back in place. And as I exited the bathroom, my mum entered the apartment with bags full of groceries. Mum, I said, following her into the kitchen, you'll probably think there's something wrong with me, but... Do you remember the old lady with glaucoma who came over here once yelling that her son was trying to kill her? Yeah, I do, she responded while unpacking the bags. I think she just died, I said. My mom then turned towards me. I don't think there's anything wrong with you. She paused for a moment, then continued. There was a fire in the neighborhood as I was coming back from the supermarket. The firefighters were taking out the lady's body from the apartment. She probably fell asleep smoking or something and started the fire. Her son wasn't home. I looked at her with my mouth open without saying a word. Her eyes turned from my face to something behind me and back to me. And then she calmly added, Don't be scared. She's here. This happened a while ago, 2013. I used to be able to astral project through meditation. I never really had any control of where I traveled. I would just automatically end up where I did. I would always end up in a barren forest in the dead of winter. Everything covered in almost a foot of snow. I only traveled there two times without any incidents. I would just wander around a while before coming back to my body. Then I encountered the creature that stopped me from ever going back. The third time I traveled to the forest, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. I wandered around a bit, walking in a random direction. I stopped for a minute and looked around. I spotted a dark shape, about six or seven feet away from me. It was this pure black wolf staring right at me. I wasn't afraid, for whatever reason. And the wolf turned and started walking away from me but stopped after walking about a foot. It looked back at me, as if beckoning me to follow it, and follow the wolf I did. I followed the wolf for what felt like 20 minutes. It led me to a clearing in the woods I had never been to before. As soon as I stepped into the clearing, the wolf ran back into the woods. I watched it run off and then looked around the clearing. The atmosphere, which had felt completely normal up until this point, shifted once I saw what was standing on the other end of the clearing. It was like a pressure pushing me down. The air itself felt heavy. What was standing on the other end of the clearing was a tall humanoid creature. Its skin appeared black, pitch black. It had cloven hooves for feet, but no fur on its body. Its body was incredibly thin, to the point of being able to see its ribs. Its arms were abnormally long. Its hands ended in long talons. It had these crooked, jutting horns. I couldn't, for some reason, make out any facial features except for its eyes. They were bright, glowing red. I was terrified and stood there for what felt like a minute or so. This creature and I were just staring at each other before I snapped back to my body. After I returned to my body, I felt like I was out of breath and couldn't stop trembling for a good while. I was understandably pretty shaken up. I tried for some research, but Google wasn't yielding the answers I was looking for. I spoke with a few acquaintances who supposedly had more experience and knowledge in these matters than I did and got some advice, which looking back now on the events that happened, was not very good advice. A few weeks after my initial encounter, I decided to return to the forest. Before going back, I formed a salt circle around myself as I was advised, as a protective measure. I entered my meditative state and found myself back in the forest, more specifically, but in the clearing, where I had the first encounter with the creature. 
Immediately I felt the pressure and heaviness in the air. Only this time it was worse. My back was turned away from the clearing facing the trees. I could feel the presence of the creature right behind me. Remembering the advice that was given to me, I summoned as much resolve and courage as I could and made what I know now was a huge mistake. I spoke to it, trying to keep my voice as steady and commanding as I could. Despite being terrified, I said, you have no power over me. Silence stretched for what was probably only a few minutes as I waited for something to happen or a response of some kind. What I didn't expect to happen was that the creature reached out and touched me. Have you ever been burned badly? I once burnt part of my hand with an iron once, and that was the closest thing I can compare the sensation to. The creature grabbed my neck, its talon hand encompassing the whole of my neck. It hurt so much I couldn't even find it within myself to scream. The next thing I knew, I was back in my body, still feeling a slight burn in my neck, but only a phantom of what I felt before. There were no marks left behind, just the memory of the feeling. I tried to put the experiences from my mind, just forget all about it and go about my life. After all, I had a part-time job and community college classes to worry about. Everything seemed normal until about a week later. Going about by day, I would catch small glimpses of the creature for mere split seconds. I was of course alarmed and my distress only became worse when I came to a horrifying realization. Each time I caught a glimpse, the creature would be ever so slightly closer. I tried to once again find answers to what happened through internet searches, but found nothing that appeared helpful, nor could tell me what I was dealing with. After a few days of dealing with this, things got even worse, as they usually do. I began to hear whispers as if they were coming from inside my head. I couldn't ever make out what they were saying, but it unnerved me greatly. As the creature grew slowly closer, the whispers grew louder. In desperation for help, I turned to my mother. My mother is a religious woman, and after I explained everything that had happened and was happening, she was extremely concerned. She immediately called the pastor of her church who came to the house, with the church's youth pastor as well. They prayed over me, spoke to me about spiritual warfare, because they assumed what I was dealing with was a demonic being. After the visit from the pastor, I did stop seeing the creature, but the whispers grew in volume and took a very aggressive tone. It began to wear on me and my sanity. My partner at the time claimed to know what the creature was and how to stop its influence in my life. I'm desperate to try anything to rid myself of this being. So I went along with what he said. I won't provide details about the ritual we performed as it was dangerous and I don't want anyone attempting such a thing. But it evidently worked. It's been about seven years since all of this happened, and I haven't seen, dreamt, nor felt the creature's presence or influence in my life since. Moral of the story, please be careful when you astral project. When I was 16, I lived with my dad, but stayed with my mum and sister every other weekend and every other week when my school was in session. I am a female. My mum was renting half of a duplex in Wisconsin at the bottom of a hill with a very old post office at the summit. I heard ghost stories about this post office slash castle throughout my childhood. We lived on the left side of the duplex. There was a door on the front of the house and one on the back, which we usually used. There wasn't really a backyard as we lived at the bottom of the hill mentioned above. When you walk in the back door, you are in the living room. Next to that is the dining room, a small entryway for the front door, then the kitchen. If you go through the kitchen, there were stairs that go 
to the two bedrooms and the bathroom upstairs. Right next to the entry to the kitchen on the main floor was the door to the basement. To the left of that was a half bath slash laundry room and a bedroom. This information is necessary, so keep it in mind. I was staying over one weekend and my youngest sister, Elena, would not sleep on her own. She was also diagnosed with ADHD, which made it tough for her to stay asleep. My other sister, Chloe, was at a sleepover one night, so I stayed in her bed so Elena could sleep in the room instead of me sharing my bed. My mum made it my job to keep her in bed and quiet or I'd get in trouble. We went to bed and everything was normal, as normal as things would ever get in that house. I woke up sometime after falling asleep and I look at the doorway. Elena was just standing there staring at me. I instantly got mad because I didn't want to get in trouble. So I whisper yelled at her to get back into bed. I asked her what she was doing and she told me she needs to go to sleep. I looked to my right and pointed to her to get in bed. But when my eyes met her bed, I realized she was fast asleep. I looked back at the doorway and whatever was there was gone. I still remember what I saw vividly. It was a little girl with dark curly hair and she had been wearing an old style dress, think 40 to 50s era clothing. I remember being really confused, but not scared and just went back to bed. This was not the first time or only thing that happened. It always felt like someone was watching me. When both my sisters were there, I slept in the downstairs bedroom alone, even in summer, when it would be really hot in the room. I had to have the windows closed and locked with the blinds and curtains closed. I had seen glowing red eyes out of it on a couple of occasions. I always felt like something was trying to get me. There were many times I'd cry myself to sleep because I was terrified. I always kept a Bible under my pillow as well. My mom blew me off any time I tried to talk to her about it. So I simply stopped trying. The scariest thing that ever happened to me was when I was all alone. My mom had taken my sisters to get groceries. After they were gone, I snuck out the back door to have a cigarette. I came back in the house when I finished and sat down on the couch to watch TV. I had the cordless phone sitting on the arm of the couch as this was before cell phones were everywhere. And I was watching my show when suddenly I heard a thud upstairs. At first I ignored it since strange things always happen. Then I heard walking above me. I started going through what it could be and I realized I had left the front door unlocked while I stayed back out to smoke. Since there weren't any vehicles at the house, I thought maybe someone came into the house while I was out. I grabbed the phone and headed towards the kitchen. I took a weapon out of the drawer and took it and the phone with me to investigate the noise. It is worth noting that the other side of the duplex didn't have an upstairs, so it couldn't have been the neighbors I was hearing. I started going upstairs and at the top, I turned to my right and go into my sister's room. I went out and checked the bathroom and opened the shower curtain to check as well. There was nothing there either. When I went to my mum and stepdad's room, they had a bed frame with drawers at the bottom so no one could be hiding under the bed. I checked both of their closets and didn't find a thing. And that was when I realized the only place I hadn't checked was the closet hall across from the bathroom. I walked out the bedroom window to the top of the stairs and told whoever was there that if they left now, I wouldn't call the police, but that my mum would be home soon. Then I ran down the stairs, through the kitchen and locked myself in my bedroom on the first floor. I sat on the floor again, the wall opposite where the door was. As soon as I shut the door, I heard someone run down the stairs behind me. As I sat against the wall, I cried and all I could see was the doorknob turning violently. I was terrified. I honestly thought someone was trying to hurt me. Then I heard the car doors close outside and everything immediately stopped. These were no footsteps or anything. 
I heard my mum and sisters walk into the house. So I got off the floor and left my room. I was still crying and my mum found me and asked what was going on. She was horrified as I stood there with a large weapon and the phone. And I told her what happened. And she just scolded me for having an overactive imagination and that I should be better and not tell my sisters. I never told them, but always thought about this experience. A few years later, my mom, stepdad and sisters were living in their newly built house. One day, my sisters and I were in the car with my mom and talking about the old house. When Elena spoke about the man she always used to see. I told the story of the little girl and my terrifying experience of being chased down the stairs. When I finished with the second story, Claire leaned forward and said, that happened to you too? I'd never told anyone about my experiences. 10 years after my family lived there, my best friend's sister's family moved in. I went with them at once to visit. And from the moment we pulled in to the driveway, my hair stood on end. The entire time I felt like something was unhappy I was there. Her sister said they just had some strange things happen, but nothing too bad. The youngest just kept talking about the old man who lived there, but the oldest living person in the house was late 30s to early 40s. And I still get chills whenever I think of that place. In 2012, I suffered a massive stroke that ended my life. As I slipped away, I had felt an overwhelming peace come over me like I'd never had before. Things went black. Then I was ascending above and saw the city below. Next to me, I heard a voice from this orb of varied colored lights that also had a mist coming off it. It was a woman's voice and she was telling me how excited she was to finally be with her family and see her mum and dad again. I started to feel unsure and told her I wasn't supposed to be here. Suddenly I was standing in an otherworldly place that was gorgeous. All the structures and buildings were made of what looked similar to marble, but had an iridescent color between the marbling. The buildings were decorated with colorful stones with gold embezzlement lining the buildings and glass fence. I walked along the path with my arms crossed and holding them to my body. I felt lost and everyone around me was chattering happily with each other in these otherworldly clothes of satin like linens. Some people held hands and were close and joyful with each other. This place was absolutely beautiful. I came upon an old man who was sitting near a tree and what seemed to be teaching a class with people surrounding him. Some were sitting and others were standing. He called me over to join him. He was teaching the lesson of what life is supposed to be on Earth, what it was originally supposed to be, and how humans were supposed to be caring for the world and the inhabitants on it. But materialism had gotten in the way among other things. I felt an overwhelming knowledge come over me as he continued to teach his class about the world, the universe, life and death. Everyone began to surround me and the old man. He put his hands on my shoulder and he said, it's not your time yet. You will know when it is. The people from the class all came in and held me in a circle. And suddenly I was back. I opened my eyes and breathed in. I was alive and back in my earthly body. This is how I came to believe in God and also reincarnation. I don't claim a religion because my beliefs are now a mix of things. Unfortunately, slowly, that knowledge that was instilled into me slowly sipped away over the years, but I felt it in the back of my mind. To me, religion became several fingers pointing to the same being. I don't need a religion to dictate my relationship with God. If you're wondering, I'm 27 now and suffer residual effects that have disabled me, but I keep going. My body may not work properly, but my brain still does. And I focus on expanding my knowledge in various areas. Twenty years ago, 
I was sleeping beside my husband, and I woke up. As I was turning over, I look over at my husband's shoulder, and saw a woman standing in the bedroom doorway, staring at my husband, intently, with curiosity. She then began moving towards him. She had no idea I was watching her. When she began walking towards him, I got angry, and I was going to launch myself over him and tackle her, but she was too far away. I was concerned. I would wake my husband, and he would get up suddenly, causing me to hurt him. Instead, I turned over, got out of bed, and went around. But by the time I got to the end of the bed, she was gone. This was no common intruder. She was approximately five feet tall, very slim, but with a definite female figure, around a hundred pounds. She was not clothed, but looked like a solid silhouette, or as if head to toe in a skin-tight black bodysuit. She did not have hair on her silhouette. Why can I describe her so well? She was less than twelve feet away from me, and this was not the first time seeing the paranormal. So no shock or fear. But although I did not mind paranormal encounters, I do not let them come near my husband. Can anyone give any hints as to what she was? She seemed solid. I could not see through her, or any details in the hall. She was darker than the surrounding night, but it might have been the moonlight. And we have skylights in the living room downstairs. When she realized I saw her, she stopped and felt surprised. I have also found info on shadow men, but this is a woman. Not a shadow, and not sinister. Does anyone know what this could possibly have been? In 1979, when my mother was 15, a large group of my extended family were gathered in my grandmother's house in rural Iowa, where most of them live. They were there to discuss what was to be done with my recently deceased great grandmother's house. You see, my great grandmother had hated the house, and so in the final six months of her life, had built another house on the same plot of land, which I guess wasn't in accordance with state zoning laws. As any logical thinker would do, they decided to ask my great grandmother herself. Ouija board in hand, the female members in the family walk out into the night to do their séance at her house, which was just down the dirt road from where they were. The house was built in the mid 19th century, had six bedrooms, was huge, and from what I can gather, didn't have any electricity. So they brought candles to light the space. About half the women in attendance were believers, with the others being skeptics, which led to some frustration with them asking questions on the Ouija board. However, sometime in the night, the energy of the house totally changed. One of my aunts asked if Margaret was there, but got no response from the board. Instead, a piece of tinsel on the doorway began to swing like a pendulum. My mum's youngest brother had just celebrated his birthday there a few weeks earlier, and the decorations were still up. It would be easy to say that the wind or atmospheric pressure could have accounted for this. However, keep in mind it was in a large house, and the rooms surrounding the central living room acted as a wind block. It is also worthwhile to point out that the candles at no point flickered nor went out. The movement continued with every question, back and forth like a pendulum. Finally, someone asks what was going to be done with the house, and the tinsel stopped moving altogether, and began to violently move in the opposite direction. The tinsel stopped responding after the question, so they moved back to the Ouija board, and no sooner had they done it did it spell out a very simple six-letter message: "Burn it." They hauled us back home. Called the volunteer fire department, and did just that. I was raised to believe that ghosts aren't real. I have also never encountered anything I couldn't explain until now. I live with my husband and a child in a house made in 1995. We didn't know the history of anyone dying or there being any problems with the house, and we'd lived there three years. During that time, lots of small things have happened. We've always laughed them off or joked about them, until last night. For example, some of the smaller things include 
being home alone during the day. The house shook a little every now and then. Photos hanging up in the kids' playroom would fall, but there'd be no reported earthquakes, flashbangs, or construction sites near us. This one time there was 7am. I called my husband who had just left for work. I felt the walls for warm pipes, checked the gas for water leaks and nothing. When I turned on the lights, I heard some large scamper. We don't own any pets. We do not have rats. And we have had the house inspected to make sure. Other things happen, like objects end up in places where they weren't before, especially this old cat puppet my husband's aunt found at an auction, which is creepy as it sounds, but my kids love it. All of these things alone have happened in the last six months of living here. Each individual thing has not caused a concern until last night at 5 a.m. when I got up to pee. I came back to bed, turned on my side to face my husband's back, and at that moment I felt something slide and push on my back. A heavy large thing, but it didn't feel like a person. It felt like if you took a heavy pillow and pushed it hard against someone, there was no warmth, no bones, no skin. At this point I'm wide awake but can't move, completely against my own choice. I want to scream and wake my husband but I can't. I know this isn't sleep paralysis because I literally just woke up to pee. Also, when I felt this thing on my back, my ears popped like a huge amount of pressure. We don't live in a high or low point where that happens and I don't have a cold. So I'm stuck with this pressure against my back, trying to focus on hands to get them to move to shake my husband. It feels like forever when in reality it's been about five minutes. Then my ears pop again. My head hurts incredibly and I can move and I sit up straight. My husband turns over and asks what's wrong because I've started to cry and I never cry. I start to explain that it's stupid and he wouldn't even believe me. He then asked why I was playing with his neck and his hair, and I told him that was impossible because of just what happened. He explained that he felt a warm thing playing with his neck hair for at least the last five minutes. We turn on the light, and his neck is red and warm. My headache dissipates after a few minutes. I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm just desperate for someone to tell me I'm not crazy, and that they've experienced something like this. Three years ago, I went to Gettysburg with my family. I've been interested in the paranormal since I was small, always drawn to it, seeing and hearing things often. When I left for college, things started happening to my sister, and we realized that she was clairvoyant, and I myself am sensitive. My dad decided he wanted to test this, so he signed the family up for a ghost tour at an old Civil War field hospital that was turned into a home, then an inn, and finally a landmark. We found out that after many bodies had been thrown from the kitchen to an area besides a building, a woman had ended her life after the government lied about the whereabouts of her fiance during World War II. There was simply so much death. Upon going up to the second floor, I couldn't breathe. I had a panic attack and no warning. I should have left them, but I went on. The others went to the attic. I followed. And later, my sister said that she could have heard a noose tightening. My parents and I saw shadows. We spoke to spirits. It was surreal. They told the men to get out of the bathroom, perhaps because the ladies needed privacy even in death. Things happened. There was so much activity and I felt watched. We ended up in what used to be a prison for Confederate soldiers. They liked underage women. My sister had been about 16. Her hair was played with, she was scratched, and three lines on the back appeared. I felt wrong. We left and I was angry. We had two more days or so in Gettysburg, and I think I was so wrong that I couldn't get all of these negative thoughts out of my head. I had nightmares. Everything people did annoyed me, and I was inconceivably angry. As soon as we crossed state lines, did I feel that I could breathe again. Later, I was researching about demonic oppression. 
a step down from possession. It leaves the victim angry, depressed, suicidal and violent, suffering from night terrors. But nothing touched me. No. Later, I was researching. And although I'm not sure what it was, I don't think it was demonic oppression. It was just oppression by some pissed off spirits. I'm sensitive, so vulnerable, especially going into places that are so packed with energy. I was essentially going in there with a target on my back. My depression, my eating disorders, my deteriorating mental state as a whole added to the fact that I had secretly stopped taking my medication, also added to the fact that I was feeling insane amounts of jealousy towards my little sister, as my father only seemed to be concerned with her powers, even though I had been doing it for a lot longer. And all of this culminated in a large hole in my defences. Trying to act big and mighty in the face of something you thought you knew about, but really had no experience in dealing with, is a surefire way to get attacked. It's rarely demons doing the attacking. If it was, well, you'd know about it. I'd like to think that I've grown in the last six years since everything's occurred. I found the universe exists in various shades of grey. There is neither good or evil, just lighter and darker varieties. I lived in eastern Kentucky my whole life. I grew up way back in the holler the last house on the road deep in the woods. I lived with my grandparents the majority of my childhood. If I wasn't there, I was next door at my mom's house. Those woods have always given me a creepy feeling. I have felt stuff watch me. I have felt things touch me. I've seen stuff that I can't explain. When I lived with my grandparents, I would sleep with my mama. My papa slept in the other bedroom because they both snored really loudly and would keep each other up. My grandma's bed was right beside the window facing the woods. My side of the bed was right along next to the window. And in the summer, she would keep up the blinds and open the screen on the window and turn on the fan on high. Kentucky summers are extremely hot and humid. I remember many nights laying there and not being able to close my eyes because I would feel something watching me from the woods. I would lay there and stare into the darkness, hoping that I wouldn't see whatever it was and that it would go away. I would lay there for hours at a time. My whole family would see little small figures dart around the house, across the hall from bedroom to bedroom. My mum has witnessed a lot in this house. One morning, my grandpa had taken my mama to work. She would go in at around 6.30 a.m. She never got her driving license, so my pup had always taken her to and from wherever she needed to go. My mum was getting ready for work that morning and thought papa had come home from town. She said, that was quick, but he didn't reply. She said she heard him rustling through the cabinets like he does every morning, working on making coffee, and she said she even heard him spit in his spit bottle. My papa had chewed tobacco for as long as I can remember. She heard the recliner being opened and went into the living room, but no one was home. She left for work as soon as possible after that. Living in the double wide we had beside my grandma, I would sleep with my mum most of the time. The heat never circulated very well to the other side of the trailer for some reason, and in the winter it would get really cold. Her bed was facing the master closet and master bathroom, and my side of the bed faced the master bathroom. I can't tell you how many times I'd seen this, but I would see a woman sitting in the bathroom floor in the fetal position. She would be crying and would look up at me every now and then. I would tell my mum about it, but she would just tell me to go back to sleep. The nights I would sleep in my bedroom, I would see what looked like little trolls in my closet scampering around. I would shut the closet door, but by morning it would be ajar. That property, the woods, and land have something on it. 
May it be an Indian burial ground, or whatever. A being up there after dark, now as an adult, I still feel stuff watching me. Some stories my grandpa told me from the 50s. He's the super religious type. The type that if he's telling a story and he messes up one fact, he'll soon correct it and say, Lord, forgive me. So I know for a fact these are the God's honest truth. My papa grew up in a one room house here in the country, not too far from where I grew up. Him and his brother, my uncle, were around 15 or 16 and were sitting on the back porch of their house, just talking and laughing, probably drinking coffee. He swears on his life that up in the sky, maybe 500 feet, a three paneled door appeared, not in cloud form, but an actual door. He said the door was white and had a small lit lantern at the bottom of the door. He watched it for hours as it just sat there. They could see the flame flickering in the lantern. And after a few hours, it just completely disappeared. Another one he told me was about his dad, my great grandpa and his dad, my great great grandpa, fishing with another father and son one night on the North Fork of the Kentucky River. They did this about once a week around midnight. Not sure why midnight, maybe better fishing. Anyway, they were heading back to town, up river, and they started hearing a funeral hymn approaching. They stopped the boat on the riverbank and said that the boat was floating towards them with nothing but an old hickory casket in it. Sat there in amazement and scared to death. He said he could have reached out and touched it. That's how close it was. The other father and son said, well, I think that's sign for us to get home. I don't think they ever went fishing at night again. I've got several other stories that happened to me. And Eastern Kentucky certainly has a vast amount of paranormal activity, if you look in the right places. My mum has this big stand thing where we put hand creams and face masks. And it's about an inch away from the counter closet to the toilet. Sometimes when I use the toilet, it falls over on top of me. I have one of those lamps with about five heads and the shades are all different colors in my room for extra light. Sometimes when I'm sleeping, I wake up to a loud bang. I open my eyes and my lamp is lying on the floor. My little brother of one has a toy piano where as long as you just touch the keys, it plays. Often I wake up to that piano playing. My siblings are at daycare and my mum is at work all the time. I wake up and I'm alone. I always turn it off. None of my siblings play with it. And it only happens when I'm alone. I have a white heat lamp for my geckos, but we haven't used one in a few weeks. Every time we screw in a brand new light bulb and turn on the lamp, the bulb will shatter. We've checked a thousand times that we're using the right bulb wattage for the right heat lamp. We even bought a new lamp and the bulbs will still explode. If anyone has any explanation for this, please tell me. I'm also scared to use the bathroom and scared to fall asleep. I saw my grandmother's ghost. I was six years old. We lived in upstate New York, just outside of New York City. Grandma Catherine lived in Chester County, and I have zero memory of her aside from this. One night, I woke at about four in the morning, walked into my parents' bedroom and sat in the leather wing chair my father sat in when he read. Across the room was my father's closet. The door opened, and Grandma Catherine walked to me about six feet in front of me, smiled, sort of bent from the waist and said, I just wanted to say goodbye. Then she turned, went back into the closet before closing the door behind her. And I went back to bed. About two hours later, the phone rang. 10 minutes after that, my mother came into my bedroom to tell me that grandma Catherine had passed away. I know, I said, 
What? My mother asked, gasped, and I told her my story. She made me retell it two or three times, then gripped me on the shoulder hard and made me swear on my eternal soul that I would never tell my father the story. Freaked the hell out as only a six-year-old can be, I agreed. I never told him the story either. He lived another 15 years and never heard it. By the way, I don't believe in ghosts, but I know that I saw my grandmother's one. How Aristotelian is that? A few years back, I was at my grandmother's funeral. My dad, brother and I had all gotten there early because we'd made good time in traffic. So we were waiting for my extended family. We ended up wandering around the cemetery. My brother and I were trying to find the oldest grave. Weird, I know, but my whole family are big history nerds and graveyards can be pretty cool as long as you're respectful and stay on the paths. We walked past this one grave and I just immediately felt awful. I became extremely cold and nauseous, even though it was warm and sunny. My breath caught in my throat and I could no longer breathe and my vision started spotting and it all went dark. I thought I was going to pass out and then it just stopped, just as quickly as it had started and I felt fine. My brother was still saying whatever he was saying before, I missed about a sentence and hadn't noticed anything. I didn't tell him about it, figuring he wouldn't believe me, so I just said we should head back before the funeral began. I probably would have dismissed the incident, except the next spring my brother and I were hanging out and climbing trees in a park. It had a lot of tall grasses you see in prairies, and a good number of trees as it backed up onto the woods. I started climbing a tree, I'd gone up a few times before, and then I got hit by the same feeling. It was the sudden nausea, inability to breathe, and vision fading out. It was identical to what I felt at the cemetery. I dropped out the tree and had to sit down until it passed. After that, I convinced my brother to leave because I felt sick, even though after it passed, I felt fine. They found a body in the woods by the park a few weeks later, mostly decomposed because it had been out there all winter creeped me out beyond belief, and I've never had that feeling since. My family and I lived at a large property called Gladstone Villa in the former mining town of Bargoed in the Carfilly County Borough of South Wales in the Valleys. From 1969 to 1978, we experienced activity that simply defied rational explanation, such as lights going on and off. We witnessed electrical cables being pulled, and my grandfather Bill claimed to have a glass bottle thrown at his head as he entered the main bedroom, missing him by inches. I didn't personally see this myself, but I can still recall the time he came from there with the broken bottles in his hand and told us what happened. There was the occasional sighting, but this was very rare indeed. So rare that in all the nine years I was there, I never once saw it, but I did hear it many times in the bedroom. It's still worth mentioning that my mother Caroline saw it on at least two occasions. There were also regular footsteps heard in the main bedroom every evening, sometimes during the day when we'd all be downstairs watching TV. One of us would turn the volume down and hear it more clearly, and my grandfather Bill would point to the ceiling and say, he's by here, he's by there now, trying to make out where the footsteps were coming from exactly. There were five members of the family that were living at Gladstone Villa. My maternal grandfather, William Higgs, known as Bill to family and friends, a retired miner who worked at the local colliery. He was a short, bald man who liked nothing more than to listen to his country and western LPs, Johnny Cash, Glen Campbell, and so on. He also liked westerns on the TV that starred John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. My maternal grandmother was Rita Higgs, 
She was a short woman who was a housewife. She was completely teetotal, but liked a smoke. She also liked collecting garden gnomes and watched soap operas on TV. My mother, Caroline Dexter, met my father at the local bakehouse in Baldwin Street. She was day shift regularly, and my father worked the night shift. He would stay behind to make her a cup of tea and chat. They dated for three years before they got married on Monday the 1st of April, 1968. The Beatles were number one with Lady Madonna, very apt. They did not get a place of their own, but decided to live with my grandparents at Gladstone Villa, which was in Cardiff Road. I was born August 24th, 1969, when everyone was listening to the latest number one of the charts, Honky Tronk Woman by the Rolling Stones. It was soon after that that my mother said that strange things started to happen. I was just a baby when she said it all started off rather quietly, like small tappings here and there, but nothing too noticeable. But in time, the activity gradually increased. One time my mother said the family heard a noise, like someone jumping down from the attic and onto the landing. Naturally, Thinking that someone was trying to break in, they went to see what was going on. When they got there, they found no one, but the hatch to the attic was open. Whatever it was eventually occupied itself in the main bedroom, which incidentally was my grandparents' bedroom. It soon made its presence known by walking around the bedroom and the sound of dragging could be heard. One day, my mother went upstairs to that bedroom to get my father up for work so he could get ready for his night shift. When she got to there, she was confronted by the sight of the ironing board placed on my father's torso as he slept. When he awoke, he was astonished to find the situation he was in. He suspected my grandfather, Bill, was playing pranks, but in time he knew my grandfather was not responsible for it and he told his work friends what was going on there, and it got around that Gladstone Villa was haunted. My parents separated in 1972, and my father left Gladstone Villa, but it wasn't because of what was going on at Gladstone Villa. It was just a breakdown of a marriage. They finally divorced on April 25th, 1975. The British band the Bay City Rollers were number one in the charts with Bye Bye Baby. Again, very apt. It would have been amusing, but for the fact of what was going on there. I was barely two years old, so I have no memory of my father living there. But he would come to see me every Saturday, take me to see my paternal grandparents and to the local cinema. Great times, even though the paranormal activity persisted. As I got older, I witnessed the activity for myself. I actually saw the poltergeist activity for myself. I saw the electrical cables being pulled by unseen forces. I saw the lights going on and off. And when my grandfather Bill would play records on Sunday, as the family did at dinner, the music would turn off on its own. It took exception to the British band Slade and any religious TV shows my grandmother Rita would watch. The local police were also involved. I remember them popping their heads into the attic, hesitating and not going in, but they suggested it was my father playing a prank on the family. A family friend, Miss Ivy France, she was more of a friend of my grandma Rita. She was very skeptical when my grandmother told her that Gladstone Villa was haunted. I can still remember Ivy going into the main bedroom, looking around and saying it was a vibration from the traffic. But she was soon to change her mind when she experienced it for herself. It was then she suggested the local press and a medium. The medium was John Matthews. And when he came to Gladstone Villa, he started by asking the family questions. He then began by challenging the spirit to perform knocking on the ceiling, and sure enough, it responded by knocking back at him. At some point, John went into a trance to try and make contact, but he failed to get a name. He later confirmed the obvious, that there was indeed a presence there, 
and it was an earthbound spirit that had unfinished business. A priest by the name of Graham Jones was called to Gladstone Villa. He blessed the property, and after a few prayers, he duly left. It was quiet for a few short months after that. No incidents, but it did return, and with a vengeance. This time it decided to show itself. One evening, my grandfather Bill, my mother Caroline and I were watching television. My grandmother Rita was reading a book when all of a sudden my mother just so happened to look to her left and she saw the full solid figure of a monk standing by the doorway. We did not see this as we were otherwise occupied, but she later described the monk in detail. Typical brown habit complete with hood over the head so she couldn't see the face. It sounded very much like a 16th century Benedictine monk. Fred Davies was also a friend of my grandfather, Bill. They worked together at the local colliery and he would visit most evenings. Fred was a slim man who would wear a flat cap and glasses and smoked some homemade cigarettes that hung from his lips when he spoke. He would sit in his favorite chair by the open fire and talk to the family and watch TV with us. One day, Fred was with us, in his usual place by the open fire. I was quietly playing with my toys by the sideboard. It was quiet, when all of a sudden, there was one very loud bang. It was so loud that Fred ducked his head, and I ran to my mother for comfort. When it was quiet, we went upstairs. My grandfather Bill would always be first, and I would be last. When we go to that bedroom, we found nothing that could account for the noise. Fred later told us that he ducked his head as he thought it was going to come through the ceiling. Fred told us of another experience he had at Gladstone Villa. My grandfather Bill liked to look out the landing window that overlooked Cardiff Road into Bargoed Town Centre. This time Fred joined him and he said he felt something brush past him. When he looked, there was nothing there. The most frightening experience I had was when I was alone in that particular bedroom. I made sure the light was on, it was very quiet, and I was laying on the bed facing the window that overlooked Cardiff Road, when I suddenly felt something heavy pounce on the bottom of the bed. I heard the bed springs go just once, and I felt the bed bounce. I didn't look straight away, but when I did, there was nothing there. I went downstairs to tell my family, and we all went back up. We saw distinctive paw marks on the bed, like that of an animal. I later found out that my grandfather, Bill, had a black Labrador called Tovey, who died before I was born. My grandfather, Bill, and my mother, Caroline, claimed to have heard a baby crying there, but as I didn't hear it at the time, I took very little notice of what they said. The activity got so bad that my mother, grandmother and I slept downstairs with the lights on. It was only my grandfather, Bill, who was supposedly brave enough to sleep up there. It was then that he himself had yet another experience in there. He told us he was lying on the bed when all of a sudden he couldn't move. He couldn't even shout for us for help. This could have well have been sleep paralysis, but he said he heard something in the room with him. My grandmother Rita had her own experiences. One day she went upstairs into the room to get my grandfather up, when she saw the boiler door room open all by itself. She didn't stay there to see what it was, but she rushed out the room. On another occasion, she said she had the sensation of something pulling her under her foot like she had stepped on this gown. We had the ghost for so long that my grandmother Rita gave her a pet name. She called him Johnny, and my grandfather Bill would shout out the name to provoke a reaction, but nothing happened. Ivy Francis's son, Charles, got to hear about what was going on at Gladstone Villa, and he came along with some friends, and with my family's permission, they went into a bedroom. It frightened one of his friends, and to this day, he still says it was a spooky place. My mother Caroline had an operation on her toe and ended up on crutches to support her. 
The local nurse would tend to her foot, and my mother sat in the chair when the nurse came that day. The nurse knelt down to tend her, and she told my mother not to hold her. My mother looked at my grandmother Rita in amazement, as she wasn't holding the nurse at all. My mother made her own conclusions that it was Johnny the ghost that was holding her, so as not for the nurse to hurt her. The only time I heard the ghost being vocal was the time we were all in the room. One of us wanted to use the bathroom and we couldn't get in there. My grandfather Bill said, he's behind there. I heard quite distinctively the sound of Gregorian chant, and that was it, nothing more. We left in the summer of 1978 when two local businessmen bought the property and Gladstone Villa was eventually converted into a small hotel and its name changed to Reds Park Hotel. On the night before we moved, there was one final incident we experienced, as if it knew that we were going and that it was its way of saying goodbye. My mother, grandmother and I got ready to go to sleep. The light was still on and then we heard the doorknob turning, as if someone was trying to get in. At first, I naturally suspected my grandfather Bill, as he was the only one who could have slept upstairs in that room, and we thought it may have been him playing a prank. I called out to him, but there was no answer, no laugh that would give him away. We then heard our belongings that were packed in the hallway being thrown around. The next day, I asked my grandfather Bill if he was playing a joke on us, and he insisted that he wasn't. And to this day, I still believe him. I had my 40th birthday party at Reds Park Hotel in August 2009 for old time's sake, and it was the female staff that told me about the ghost, and I told them about what happened to me there 30 years before. The staff told me of their own personal experiences, the lights going off and on, the odd sightings in room five, a bride in white was seen. Again, the claims of the baby crying that made no sense at the time. I did a thorough research of the property and the Cardiff Road area, and I found out some very interesting things indeed. I found out from the Bargoed Library and local newspaper archives that Gladstone Villa dates back to the 1900s, and it was named after the former British Prime Minister, William Gladstone. I discovered the previous people that lived there, the Kimmet family in 1924, a newly married couple, Michael and Evelyn Kimmet, and a son named Elvin. He died at four months, according to the archives. This may explain the baby my mother and grandfather kept hearing in the bedroom. Miss Evelyn Kimmet died 1970, soon after I was born. Maybe this was why the activity all started. I also found that there was a monastery in Baldwin Street where my parents met and worked. And there was a property directly opposite the former Gladstone Villa property in Cardiff dating back to the 16th century. It is now a public house called the Rafa Club. A priest hide is said to be there, but it's sealed up. This explains the monk my mother saw. What I have said here is true. I wouldn't share it with you if I couldn't possibly back this up, and I have used real names as not to hide anything, and all I have said can be verified by the family of those people mentioned. Sadly, some of those are no longer with us. I challenge any hardened skeptic and firm non-believer, and I can assure them that they will indeed most certainly question their belief system. Of this I have no doubt whatsoever. You may Google the property, it's still there on Cardiff Road, Argode, Wales, UK, very near Caerphilly in Cardiff. This place needs to be thoroughly investigated and is well worth documenting. Two months after my mum passed, my dad sort of disappeared and I was home alone a lot of the time. So my little cousin would stay over with me a lot of the time because he was having family issues too. One night we were gaming really hard and got hungry, and so we went into the kitchen to get some food. As I walked out of my room, we'd just see literally every single cabinet door, drawer, the dishwasher, 
and a fridge all opened, and naturally I was extremely terrified. So my cousin and I ran back into my room. This isn't a big place, it's just an apartment, because we didn't know what to do. It did not look like anyone got into our place. My cousin was extremely afraid of ghosts, and I was petrified because I thought I was haunted, and I didn't know what to do. So I ran out and turned off all the lights, as electricity bills were expensive for my 15 year old self at the time, and pretended like nothing ever happened. And the creepiest thing happened after that. My cousin and I saw two feet in the darkness of the hallway away from the room in the kitchen. We never slept with the lights off in that apartment again. I now live with slight paranoia that something is always around me. And it bothers me a lot because I sometimes feel like I'm just crazy. And other times will get this sense of dread and tell myself to let it pass. And I would like to tell some of my friends and family the story. But they always say that I'm just imagining it. But why would I ever make it up? I live in Japan, but I am American. So my language skills on both sides aren't too sharp. My spouse is Japanese, and we have one child together and decided to move to Japan. So once I moved to be with them, we waited a few years before we started going house hunting. I didn't want to live in the country since that's where I lived my entire life and hated it. And also didn't want to live in a big city like Tokyo or Kyoto. We compromised and decided maybe returning to my husband's hometown would be best. So that way my in laws could be involved with our son. I think everyone was pretty excited with my willingness to be closer to the family. We ended up finding a really amazing realtor who was very patient with my American demands. Wide open floor plan with three to four LDK. So bedroom, living room, dining room and kitchen. We went to see a couple of places. And in my mind, I'm pre denying anything where my five foot one self could jump up and touch the ceiling, or if I could touch both walls with my arms outstretched in a hallway. I know the realtor was exhausted with my demands, but he worked hard and found a brand new development with almost everything I wanted. There were three homes he wanted to show us. So we brought our son and my mother in law, who helped keep his attention while my husband and I spoke to the realtor. The first home was nice. High ceilings, enough room for our family, but not enough parking. We moved on to the next house just next door. This place wasn't up to my expectations. It was much smaller than the first with an awkward layer. While I looked around with my mother in law, we heard what sounded like hammering upstairs. She mentioned that since it was a new development, the contractors may be finishing up and cleaning upstairs. That's when I noticed my son had wandered off. I called out to him and he runs down the stairs screaming for his grandma and pulling her arm with urgency. Before I could tell him to behave, the realtor hears the same hammering sound. My husband asks if the contractors were still here because we wanted to take a look upstairs. He replied telling us no. Everything we were looking at today was basically ready to move in. And that's when my son started saying crow, crow. Confused, we followed the realtor upstairs and found in the main bedroom, several crows had been ramming themselves into the windows. They would perch up on the railing of the balcony, fly a short distance, then ram into the window with such force, they would fall on the balcony and lay motionless for a moment before attempting to do it again and calling loudly. Our realtor uneasily ended this home tour abruptly. As we walked down next door, my mother in law mentioned how strange it was that the home we saw before only a few feet away didn't have the problem. I dismissed it that maybe the animals aren't used to the buildings and Japanese crows are pretty annoying and have real personalities. Someone must have crossed them, right? I didn't like the home anyway. The third home felt so heavy as soon as we entered, I tried to ignore it and enjoyed the dining room just adjacent from the kitchen. It was almost perfect. I could make it work. I knew it. There was even a large backyard for our two dogs that the realtor even considered in his search. The living room was a bit small, but again, I could make it work. No crows upstairs confirmed by my mother and son in law. 
I took it upon myself to look out the window of the living room. I really wish I didn't. See, my parents and sister always say we inherited a gift to see things others cannot. Throughout my life, I've been through so much therapy and taken so much medication to make the sounds and vision stop. But there's no such thing. I was in a very good place at that moment in time. And I look out the window and there's a small forest, tall trees and grass. But what was out of place was a large man standing there staring back at me in my direction. He didn't look right. He was charred. His skin was clearly burned. And although he was a good distance, I could see the shrinking crinkle around his neck and shoulders. I couldn't move. I wanted to so badly. That's when I saw his eyes directly. Dark black centers surrounded by white, as if his eyelids were burnt off. I heard my husband calling me, asking me something about my opinion until I guessed he noticed I didn't move or stop staring. I felt him step to my side and he asked if everything was all right. All I could muster as I kept an eye with the man was, can you see him? I didn't want to stop looking in case he moved and everyone thought I was crazy. My husband looked but said, the forest is nice. We need to make sure the dogs don't wander off in there and get ticks. He didn't see him, only I could. I thought I was good. I thought I got better. My husband asked me, do you see anything else or something? When he grabbed my hand to get my attention, I finally looked away to our realtor. Confused, he looked at me with an awkward smile. I guess I looked too serious and asked him what happened in the area. He said he didn't know when asked me why. I told him I saw a man in the forest and I didn't include the details. I just wanted to know if anything had happened. I watched him go through his folders and shake his head before telling me he didn't know, but since we were starting to like the home, he would check for us. It was an uneasy ride home. The burnt face of the man stuck in my head as my husband and his mother spoke about the last home's great features. A few hours later, we went to my in-law's place for dinner. My husband asking me why I was so quiet if I liked the home so much. Sending my son to another room to play, I explained to him and his parents in detail what I saw. Maybe they all thought I was crazy, because his dad was quiet before getting up and going to another room and bringing a map. Pointing to it, he asked us if this was the area. My husband confirmed, and my father-in-law's face was stoic, and he nodded before explaining that there was a reason that area was a new development. The government just released the land because it had passed the allotted time of closure after an accident. He elaborated that when he was younger, he heard of a plane crash happened there where several people died. The main area where it landed was still closed off and the government owned the place where bodies and debris were found to cleaned up and it has slowly been released. My mother-in-law is really superstitious, probably where my husband gets it from and says we should forget that area. A few moments after dinner, we get a phone call from our realtor, who apologizing profusely that he didn't know any deaths had occurred in the area, confirmed what my father-in-law said was true. After his many apologies, he promised to do a better job researching his area and asked if we had known about the area before. My husband replied saying that I am not familiar with anything in the entire city since I'm not from here. So there's no way that I would have known what happened many years ago. Once all the apologizing and promises were done, my husband hung up and his parents didn't judge me. They only said it's good to know sooner rather than later. They truly believe I have a talent as well. But even if that's true, I don't want to believe it. Even if this isn't the only time this has happened. My wife swore the house we lived in about 10 years ago was haunted because she's a nurse and she works three 12 hour days per week. That left her alone in the house at least twice a week. I worked, the kids had school and she claimed she heard doors open and close and saw things from the corner of her eye but never really saw anything. I'm a skeptic. The house was built in 79 and is in an established subdivision. 
I explained it may be noises from the outside she's hearing. She had a lot of family pictures hung down below the hallway. If the bathroom door was open, the light from the window shined down the hall. The sunlight would often filter through an oak tree and make the light dance off the glass in the picture frames. The illusion of movement catches your eye, but there's nothing there. She disagreed and stood by her claim. She never felt malice or was scared, she just said that there was something there. I'm a skeptic. She isn't. We agree to disagree. One Saturday morning, we're in the master bedroom on our computers. Just her and me, and our beagle. Arkley was asleep on our bed. Our son had called earlier and said he was coming over any minute. I hear the door open and Barkley jumps up and goes to open the bedroom door, looks down the hall and barked. I heard the door close. It wasn't just the sound of the door. It was also the sound a house makes when an outside door opens and the pressure changes in it. I called out that we were in the back. Barkley jumped back up on the bed and resumed his nap. A few minutes went by and both my wife and I focused on finishing up emails or whatever. Then I realized our son was still in the front of the house. I called out and got no response. So I went down the hall to find him. He wasn't there. I checked the front door and the deadbolt was locked. The garage door was locked, as well as the patio door. While I was scratching my head, our son drove up. I asked him if he had just gotten to the house. I heard it. She heard it. The dog heard it. But there was no way any of those doors were opened. And nobody opened a door to leave. I've got nothing. Well, unless you count my wife telling me, I told you so. Then I got plenty. But I can't explain what happened at all. And that was my only experience. But my wife complained all the time. Nothing mean, spirited or evil. Just odd. I had a school trip to the concentration camps in Germany and Austria. I remember arriving at the first camp on our itinerary, Dachau. When we got off the bus, they told us to get the banners, flags and flowers and to put them at the front as a memorial. I got the peace flag. It was a rainbow flag with a big peace sign on it. When we were in front of the gate, I remember feeling incredibly overwhelmed and being stared at. It was a creepy feeling, but I didn't mind it. As we walked through the gate, the first thing I saw was the window on the barrack I had in front of me. I saw a bald, beaten up man in the prisoner's blue and white uniform. We stared at each other for at least five seconds and he looked at the flag I was holding. I blinked and the man wasn't there anymore. I didn't really mind it because I believe in the supernatural and I expected that to happen. The tour guide afterwards gave us a device to put on our ear for us to hear him better. As he was speaking, telling us about his father's experience, as he was a child of an ex-prisoner there, my ear device started having problems. I started hearing only static sounds, so I decided to remove it. But before I was able to do this, I heard a man's voice saying words I couldn't understand. And the aura of his voice was so creepy and so angry. I was so shocked and creeped out because he seemed angry at me. I removed my earpiece quickly and moved on with the others. I'm the only foreigner in our class. So the explanation I give to myself for the earpiece thingy was that it was the man and he was angry at me for being there. 